Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. My name is Chet. And uh, today we are interviewing Mikey Rotella, who's a really great sculptor in the effects business that I just kind of missed. I was getting out. He was getting in as a sculptor, I guess. I knew him as a mold maker, and he's climbed the ranks to be one of the best sculptors in the business. So um, really super fun talking to him. He's kind of this uh, a younger generation of sculptors and effects. So it was really great chatting with him about the current state of effects and hearing his story about how he got into it. Really fun, really interesting, great conversation. Uh, so that's coming up. I got my dog in here with me. She's afraid of the wind because it's windy outside. I don't know why she's afraid of the wind. I got a new chair, so you will hear no more chair squeaks. Listen. I'm rocking back and forth. No squeaks. This chair is amazing. Um, my other chair, I was noticing how badly it squeaked constantly, and then it started falling apart. So I had to get a new chair. If anybody wants a really good office chair, someone recommended on Twitter to me the Steel Case. Oh, what's it called? Leap. Steel Case Leap like $850 chairs. And I found this place on eBay that refurbishes them. So I got it for like 250 bucks. And this thing is so solid. It's great. What a chair. I love it. The only problem is now I don't want to get up out of it. Um, okay. So yeah, that's what's going on here. A uh, new chair, uh, uh, shipping dystopia books. I'm at 328 books shipped, which is well over half. I have, I'm still confirming addresses and all that stuff. So it's almost done. I got the dystopia talking boards, Ouija boards. I had got those made. Those are all packed up and ready to ship. So getting dystopia rewards out. Oh my God, it's finally happening. Um, so that's good. Uh, still my goal. I'm going to, I know I'm going to, I'm going to make it this year. It's going to be done wrapped up. I mean, if I had, if everybody contacted me on Kickstarter, I would be able to ship all the rest of the books, but people don't check their Kickstarters and the, the Kickstarter has limited the way I can contact people on there. So, uh, because it's five years old, the, the project, so it's just a pain in the ass. I have to go through one at a time, basically, and email everybody, get another 300, 300 or let 295 addresses confirmed anyway. So that uh, I'm supposed to be starting the zombie death bots paintings, but I'm about a week behind on that. Cause I'm doing tool posters. I have to get those out. And yeah, working on tool poster doodles and then I'm going to start the zombie death bots paintings and Kickstarter rewards is my life dystopia. I'm dying to promote this book. I, I want to, you know, I'm going to have Mike on for the podcast. We're going to talk all about the book and how we made it. And, but I'm, I have to wait until I can, you know, start selling them to the public. Even though I do have them on my um, website for pre-sale, but they're you know they're not shipping until all the Kickstarter stuff goes out. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's weird. My hands are tied. I feel like I want to promote. I want to go on a book promotion and, and promote the hell out of this book because because it came out so well. But I'm still I uh, haven't delivered them all to the Kickstarter people, so I kind of want to wait. Anyway, we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, what else? I guess that's that's it. Oh, sponsor. Sponsor. Skull Shop. If, you, if, you're, if you're listening to this and not watching the video podcast, that's a Skull Shop skull opening and closing its mouth. Look at how good that is. It's amazing. Anyway, they're sponsoring us. If you join at the $5 and above level on the Patreon, 
at the end of the month, we will draw names and you can win a free skull. And they've got the most amazing skulls in the skull business. So if you want to take part in that, you can just go to patreon.com slash dark art society and join up. And uh, you can join for as little as a dollar, but if you join at the $5 and up level, you can get a free skull, possibly. You're entered entered to in the drawing. Uh, but even at the dollar level, you get uh, entry to the Facebook group. And uh, I think at the $3 level, you get on the Discord. I don't know. Everything's crazy. There's so much going on. I just can't keep up. I'm at this point where I just, it's like, everything's great, but it's just too busy. It's too crazy. Anyway, um, is there anything I mean? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, new subscribers. Uh, I don't think there are new subscribers this month. <laughs> we had two people delete their pledges. Well, Tanya Tracy uh raised her pledge thank you tanya and let's see jen's warming raised his pledge so thank you for that again if you want to join patreon.com slash dark art society uh be part of the community lots going on um i guess that's it i keep thinking there's something I'm not saying, but it's probably not true. Uh, let's get on with the, the interview because I'm probably fast forwarding anyway through this part. Uh, all right, here we go. Let's get on with it. The interview with Mikey Rotella. Hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Hello, Mikey. What's up? It's Mikey, right? Or do you go by Mike or Michael? I'm, I've always known Mike. you as Mikey. Yeah, yeah. My, Mikey's kind of fun just because nobody goes by Mikey. So I feel like, you know, if you can do a Johnny or a Tommy, why can't you do a Mikey? You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. I've always, I, I was introduced to you as Mikey. So I just always thought of you as Mikey. <laughs> cool, cool. I don't, I don't mind Mike or Michael, whatever. It doesn't really matter, but. Okay. But Mikey seems a little easier because there's like always 50 mics in the room. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go with Mikey. So how's it going, Mikey? <laughs> Doing awesome, man. I'm, I'm pumped to be here. Oh, great. Yes. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I've been uh, admiring your sculpture work for years now. And, uh, and you're, you're carrying the, you're carrying the boogity monster torch. Nice. <laughs> nice. That, that means a lot, man. It means a lot, especially coming from you. I've been a fan forever. Like literally forever, probably since I was about ten or eleven years old, <laughs> and uh, I just I just wanted to show you right here. Why well, I got a little something. Oh no out. way! You have that <laughs> gore zone. <laughs> that's right? about that's about as long as I've been a fan. So wow, there you go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was gore zone. God, I was like twenty one or something, or God, twenty one or twenty two. That's crazy. That's too funny. That's awesome, man. Not not to put you on the spot, but that was, <laughs> that was huge. You know, seeing seeing that was huge. You know that that meant like, oh man, there's real people out there doing this stuff, right. and I, I want to be one of these guys. You know, and I stuck with me forever. So that's huge. And now you ask me to do this, I mean, that means the world. Seriously. So oh, that's awesome. Well, that's great. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's cool. And that's... I might be the I might be the only guy that sorry to interrupt. I might be no. the only guy that takes boogity as a compliment. <laughs> I meant it as a compliment. <laughs> you nice, know exactly. Nice, nice. You know exactly what I meant. <laughs> oh yeah, I love it. It's I love like it. I, I, I'm trying to. I got out of effects, and now I'm trying to carry that same torch with, put it into fine art as you know to kind of like represent that. You know, we're serious about this in a way. It's like I'm serious about. I think monsters are just the coolest shit ever, and so oh, yeah. the idea of like putting them as fine art you know it, it really came to me working at rick's i was like you know this is fine art it's just not in the fine art context these guys are better sculptors than any of the blue chip artists that are that are making money as sculptors 
you know, the people oh, in yeah. effects. And it's just like, it's just the, and it's why I started kind of doing those conjoined shows. It's like, it's the context that really, that uh, will, will get people to consider it like a real art form. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. And it's, it's, it's kind of a bummer because we are the only people that understand that being yeah. inside and seeing, seeing the talent that that's in these shops and people outside, especially in the fine art world, they might not know. So this oh, is yeah. a huge opportunity. I mean, you're, you're, you know, spearheading that whole movement to show people. And the cool thing is that people are actually catching on now. So that, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. You know? I think it's changed. I think it's changing. It's become more accepted. And, uh, you know, like with Guillermo's tra that traveling show of his, it's like, that was in, fine art museums up alongside you know real fine art paintings and stuff you know that was really kind of a legitimizing thing for all of us i think totally as it should be as it should mm -hmm. be because the talent is is astronomical and the the you know attention to detail the technical you know skill yeah. it's it's, uh, it's kind of unheard of i always say i that's why i love you know creature effects you know and 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 sort of the effects movie world I mean, we have so much going on in one place. It's like every type of art right. is represented right. in one way or another. You have all these different technicians and, and, you know, it's like an assembly line of super talented people, Right. you know, from, from engineers to, to, you know, to artists. It's insane. Yeah, it is amazing. I don't think, you know, even though effects have, have gotten so much more popular uh, over the years, I, I still don't think people, people don't realize how, how much goes into this stuff. <laughs> you know, unless you work on some big movie and see it happening, you know, you got like, you know, like Mark Satrakian, who also, you know, I don't know if he's even in the business anymore, but it's like, he's mechanizing these amazing uh, animatronics. And then, and then he's like moonlighting, making robots for the government, like high tech robots. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, that's the level that the, these things are done at, you know, the yeah. highest level. Not to mention robot wars and shit like that. Yeah. I mean, right. He's like, not messing around right yeah no, he's, he, i think he's still around man and, and that guy he's one of those those you know he's a perfect example i mean that's like the top like mm -hmm. you're not going to get anyone better at what he does as specific as what he does is and and that's you know people aren't aware of that stuff which is why i love that you see a lot of behind the scenes stuff more mm -hmm. and more you know and, that, and that's the stuff that that got me interested i mean like i was you know gore zone you right. know these great how to's and and the fx labs and all, all that stuff and uh being able to see lights camera action and movie magic and all those shows the 80s was a huge time to sort of show what was going on behind the right. scenes and it's only gotten more and more and more and now here you come taking the fine art world and sort of shoving our effects yeah. monster you know, <laughs> creature world in their face and going look look you see now what's up yeah now? yeah it's, it's pretty big yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm doing my best to shove it in the faces. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. That's uh, great. You know, it's funny. I worked with Satrakian on the Blob when it was like one of his. I think it was one of his yeah. first movies because there was a lot of us. We were like new, and um, he had this uh, like three inch bird mechanical bird head he had made, like a miniature mechanical bird head, and it was like radio controlled eye blinks and it was like this little teeny bird head and he i remember he brought it in and he was showing everybody at the shop and it was like whoa this dude's a total genius full-on genius you know and he was yeah. just like young like we were all so young back then and he was doing this shit like i guess i think maybe he had worked at ilm before that or something he's just amazing that's so crazy and yeah the 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 fact that he can do the delicate, intricate stuff as well as like the big, you know, crazy hydraulic, -y, you know, just mm -hmm. just wild. But yeah. the blob that that's that's a huge moment right there. I mean, that just so many awesome people on that thing. I would kill to have been in that world with you guys. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. time was perfect. You know, I know it's, it was insane. it was amazing. It was like I feel so lucky that I got in on that because if in a way, and I I I half joke about this, but it's kind of true. It's like even though, you know, there's always these peaks and valleys and stuff. It was never like that again. It kind of slowly went down because the <laughs> budgets, time frames. we had like, it was a long production period. It was all these like star effects people like Sean McEnroe from, I mean, Sean, oh, when was the last time you heard of that guy? Rick's, Rick's group, Bill Sturgeon, uh, Lyle Conway, Satrakian, oh, okay. Bill Corso, when he was just like a kid, like all of us. 
and uh, all these a bunch that oh Mike Smithson, Brian Wade. Uh, there was just a bunch. It was like this all star team, and there was like a lot of time and a lot of money. And I was so like green. I was like, I, I was doing whatever when I came in, I was making molds or sweeping the floor, cleaning up. I was totally like starting at the beginning. And then by the end of it, I was able to um, like sculpt that little Eddie character and paint him like I had an effect. And I did the sheriff and the, the sheriff's head in the elevator. I don't know if you remember the sheriff galleries are like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, it was cool. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> What's that? the phone booth right yeah 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 so so it was like it. it was a really really cool time um the closest thing i guess maybe was working at rick's because it's like the thing i loved about rick's was just like all the there was always resources and usually the time there was time to do stuff right but you've worked on oh, tons yeah. of stuff i was checking out your imdb imdb and uh man you so where did we meet where did we meet I'm pretty sure we just we just met at some of the shows like, you know, conjoined and and uh, Monster Palooza and stuff like that. Like we didn't just, meet in just, a shop. No, we I, see because when I when I got in, you you were just sort of on your way out, like you were kind of making that that transition. Mm -hmm. And I, I had only worked at a couple shops. And so we never we never really cross paths in the shops. You might have come through at some point, one of the places maybe, and, and, you know, when we met. But uh but yeah, yeah, we never got to work together, which is a bummer. You know what I mean? Because yeah. that's when I was when I was coming out here, I was like, oh, oh, dude, I can't wait to work with this guy, this guy, this guy. Right. And you know, a lot a lot of people were on their way out, and you know, some people <laughs> you just you never get that chance. Even even you know here at K and B now, I, I got here just in time for Norman to be gone, Mitch to be gone. Like right. all the guys that I was excited to, to work with, I'm like, oh, damn it. But there's some great ones too. I got to work with Dave Grasso, you know, oh, cool. Andy yeah. Schoenberg, um, you know, Andy Burkholz, like there's just awesome people. But, you know, those those key dudes that I, I've been, you know, obsessed with since I was a kid, I'm like, man, what the fuck, guys? You got to leave <laughs> as soon as I'm coming in? And, well, you know at, least, at least you got a little bit of Mitch. Because Mitch, oh, yeah. like I'm, Mitch, uh, he retired. So he, you know, you yeah. probably worked on one of the last things he ever worked on. And he's like, you know, the biggest, most amazing oh, yeah. sculpting legend in the business, pretty much. I mean, he's, he's legendary. Yeah, he's, I would put him up there with the best in the, in the world. I don't yeah. care, you know, where, where you're, where you are, you know, with your industry or, or art or, you know, whatever it is. But uh, I, I, I was lucky to get to work with him, you know, a few times and and dark crystal was was a huge one and oh, that was cool. you know with miles tevis matt rose chad waters you know i mean dude i was freaking out you know what I mean? like <laughs> it, it was you know russ lukage like just badasses so oh that's awesome I, i've had i've been lucky getting to work with with some some serious heroes of mine and and learning a ton from those right. guys. You know? yeah that's and plus a... having fun with them too you know Mitch, yeah yeah obviously yeah <laughs> i'm sure he farted on you many times oh uh, yeah, yeah i've smelled way too many oil <laughs> bowls you know it's like, <laughs> it's like exactly that's exactly he's still he was still eating pollo bowls yeah that was his thing at lunch eat a pollo bowl and then come and fart on me after you know after lunch yeah um, i thought it, i thought he was like working for uh, you know a pollo loco i'm like what why why are you so proud of this he was like <laughs> proud of it like you know i haven't eaten anything for lunch but this and 30 something i'm like why though <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so bitch uh yeah, that's pretty good yeah so well i said because i i thought this is my memory it's it's screwed up for sure but but i thought that i met you when you were making molds somewhere i mean we yeah. probably met around the same time that i, I, was, okay. I was in the mold shop so i did but, yeah i didn't realize you were a sculptor until i kind of got out and then i saw you on facebook and i was seeing your sculptures and i've just been watching them all these years and uh and i just thought it was so cool that you were such a great sculptor i had no idea when i met you oh thanks man i mean that that's huge i i've been trying you know i'm just like trying to keep getting better and getting better and and you know i luckily working with with some of those guys has has helped that you know oh immensely. yeah it's huge and, yeah a few people have given me opportunities here and there and you know i was sort of able to to you know crawl my way 
into the sculpting department and, and doing doing more art department stuff. And I, you know, I've just uh, luckily been able to do that. I'm going on like ten years legit as a sculptor. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? In, yeah, in, yeah. In the shops, you know. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Not. I mean. Not that you're primarily a mold maker, but a lot of, you know, you, I, I, throughout the, my years in the business, it's like a lot of times there would be mold makers that wanted to sculpt and they ended up usually being so good at molds that they couldn't get out and they ended up just getting stuck in the mold department. And there's, you know, you and a few other, you know, not that many, I can only think of one other person off the top of my head, but I I am sure there's more were able to make, make it out of the mold department into the sculpting yeah, department yeah. and then like just flourish in the, in the sculpting department. So it's super, it's super cool to see that because it's hard. Um, it's a lot harder to do it nowadays, I think, because everything's so compartmentalized and departmentalized back on the blob. Oh, yeah. Every, everyone was kind of doing everything, you know, a little bit yeah. of everything, which was, which was pretty cool. But um, that's, that's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to do a little bit. Yeah. I wanted to just be a, a part of, of, of that whole thing. And I've gotten a chance to do that on some shows almost by accident, but you know, it, it's weird because getting out of the mold shop when you're, you know, you say like, Oh, there's guys that are so good that they kind of get stuck. Right. Well, I, luckily I, I sucked. Like I'm, I'm a terrible mold maker. <laughs> so that kind of worked in my favor. They were like, well, we could have you screw all this shit up over and over again, or maybe we'll just throw some clay at you and see what you can do. Right. So luckily I would always keep bringing in little sculptures and stuff and being like, well, the reason I suck at this is because I'm one of these guys, you know? And, and it was just like, whatever man like you gotta you gotta prove yourself so yeah you know i i climbed up the ladder you know the only way i i knew how and i i lucked out so that that's pretty pretty sweet but if i was really good at molds then it might be even harder (laughs) yeah we we need you over here they were like get out of (laughs) here i i almost got stuck in the i was afraid i was gonna get stuck in the paint department because i came at rick's because it's like i was the sculptor at alterian for you know 80 87 86 87 whenever the blob was happening until like uh i don't know the mid i don't mid or late 90s or something and so i was just sculpting designing i was like you know the big cheese over there and then i get to rick's and then that and then i got laid off and um and then i uh bill sturgeon was able to get me in to rick's as a painter just painting these who ears for for um the grinch and it was two colors it was like airbrushing you know caucasian flesh tone and pink over and over hundreds so boring he even told me he's like you're way he's like you're way over qualified for this job but if you want it you can have it and maybe you could work your way into the sculpting department and um and I did that for a long time, painting those ears. I took over when Tom Gilliland was leaving to go start Sideshow or to go do Sideshow collectibles oh, full time. Wow, yeah. And so I was like replacing him. So he was training me. And then uh, and then I was able on the Planet of the Apes to uh, sculpt some maquettes, ape maquettes. And then and then uh, Rick just kept me in sculpting department. So I was like, whew, got out of there because <laughs> I didn't really want to be in the paint department. My whole that, time. that's awesome though and that's again another like era right i mean you know at alterian you know with with badasses on the blob and stuff like that the best makeup guys the best puppet guys at, at that moment mm-hmm. then transitioning into ricks mm-hmm. where you have the best of the best across yeah the board, yeah yeah that was know? like yeah that was a wake-up call to me is like oh, see, yeah. working with people like kazu and mitch and matt and steve wang and it was just like and Norman, it was, it was like, uh, I really got so much better just working, just ha- working with those guys, just, just watching how, wow. how, how, how that's like such a huge thing. Cause you know, I didn't get to work alongside people as much at, um, Alterian, you know what I mean? Cause I was sort oh, of yeah. like in charge of the art department. So it wasn't like, but when you're like sculpting stuff right on the floor, right next to Mitch, I like grabbed the table right next to him when i got nice. there because i was like oh, i'm working with it because i knew <laughs> and then he showed me all kinds of shit he showed me all of his oh, texturing yeah. techniques he's like the most open guy about that stuff pretty amazing um yeah yeah and that's i mean that's exactly what i what i that was my philosophy too like look i need to be in close proximity to the best to get better yep. and if i can just by osmosis just get anything right just any little thing 
you know, that, that's just going to take me to another level and, totally. you know, just, just keep jamming. And, and he was like that with me too. I mean, I didn't learn everything, you know, I wish that I had more time, but you know, he'd make me tools and just, I know he would do that to me too. He I'm would, like, I don't know if I should, if I should use this, he or had I should a, just like put it away. I know he would have a tool that I would like, I was admiring these t- texture tools and I was like, oh man, I got to make one of those tools. He's like, oh, here, you can have it. And then he'd go and he'd <laughs> make his own, a new one for himself. It was so crazy. He's just like so generous Same. like that. So amazing. He's yeah, so cool. Amazing dude. I guess he could, he could tell, he could tell like when people really, really gave a right. shit and they really wanted to know. And, and, you know, especially when, when I met him, because I, I met him working at Paul McCarthy's. So I was in the oh, mold maybe, shop at Paul McCarthy's. That's maybe where I met you. Cause I oh, was okay, working yeah. at Paul's for Kazu oh, for right. a while. I bet you that's where we crossed paths somehow. I bet you that was it. Cause I was it, working, it cause, cause I was working with Mitch. Did you work when yeah, yeah. I sculpted on Paul's nutsack and butthole on the <laughs> yeah. sculpture of yeah. him bent over on all fours? Oh yeah. I was there for dreaming Paul. I remember that. That might've been a little bit before, you know, the, the bent over one. I don't, I don't even know, but they all had buttholes. I worked, and, yeah. you know, so I, <laughs> I worked on something else too, though. It wasn't just that. It was, yeah. There was some other stuff. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, um, no, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was in the mold shop, so I, I would go up and bother Mitch. And I'm not even in, in the department, you know, and he right. was still cool about it. You know, he was like, yeah, check out this, you know, G.G. Allen CD. And I'm like, oh, fuck yeah. You know, and then they were like, you know, talking about stupid movies and just having fun. And, and every once in a while, he'd, you know, show me something like he was working on a bunch of heads for Kevin McTurk at the time. Uh-huh. He had like a Barbara uh-huh. Steele and a Peter Cushing. And I was just like, holy shit. Like, I, I didn't even know that you could sculpt that well. I know. He, 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 you know? You've, seen, you've seen his little... Uh those famous things he did in the eighties, which is like John Carradine's life mask. Oh and, yeah. yeah. Uh, Those Boris Karloff. Man. Yeah. They're like, you know, five or six inches tall. He, yeah. he, he sculpted those, you know, they look like print 3d prints and people, you know, I've shown them to people that didn't believe me. They weren't 3d prints. Got like a yeah, small version insane. of a live cast. It's like, he's like this weird, he's, he's like a, uh, he's like a genius like a weird he's got this weird genius part of him he's really smart but i mean you wouldn't think he was like a super genius he just seems like a very smart guy but 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 he's like he's almost like some kind of savant when it comes to sculpting it's really like he can reproduce anything absolutely perfectly it's kind of insane it is nuts it's like it's it's like a mathematic thing i know yeah yeah breaking down inside his head right and you know he's just you know, stuff, stuff that I could probably never wrap my head around, but just, just being around that. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's just going to, going to give you something. You're taking something with you, you know, and that, that's so huge. Yeah. You yeah. know, so, I mean, I, I'm sure Rick's was, was unbelievable. I never got to work for Rick. You know, I, I was always oh. like, like born too late, like that St. Vitus song. You know what I mean? Like I, I never got to work, you know, at, at stands, like right. for Stan. I never got to work at Rick's, you know, I remember Jim McLaughlin, he, he hit me up once he, he's actually i saw him at a, at a bar and he's like oh you're still around man i'm like what do you mean he's like oh i you know you got off of facebook and i'm like yeah i was i was taking a break from facebook he's like oh i thought you moved home to the east coast so i was gonna call you to come into ricks for men in black three and I was oh like, my god what? i'm like jim you have my phone number what are you talking about why wouldn't you hit me up he's like all right i, I don't know i was just gonna be like in the mold shop you know but still, I would, anything you know? yeah anything I, like you said i would have I would swept the floor and clean toilets you know and, <laughs> and uh, but that was my one chance and i, I missed it and then uh, shortly yeah. after that as you know they closed the doors and i was just like you know right in the heart i know that was that was at the end that was at the end of an era for sure that shop was insane that whole crew was insane there's just so much yeah. talent such a great working environment is really really amazing it's i have like a five years of great memories from that which is really cool oh yeah and um, then they, they had that auction i, I know oh you know, yeah he had, he yeah had this big garage sale and everyone was so excited we're gonna go to cinnovation to the garage sale i'm like are you crazy this is the most depressing thing I i've know. ever heard i, I know. don't want to go to a garage sale of cinnovation are you crazy and then they had the the auction and i i wasn't working at the time i'm between jobs i'm depressed already I find out about the auction, right? Yeah. <laughs> I go, I go to the auction. I sign up and everything. They gave me a paddle as if I had any money to spend on any of that stuff. 
and I just sat there and like kind of <laughs> pouted <laughs> while they were like auctioning off all this gold, you know, Heron Anderson's feet. I'm like, oh no, I'm like <laughs> all sad. It was hilarious. And like I had this, I had this little like in the back of my head, I'm like, I'm gonna try to go after one of Chet's background masks from from Haunted Mansion because they had like an opening bid of like 300 bucks. Yeah. So in my stupid brain, my poor kid mind, I'm like, oh, I think I could do that. You know what I mean? Well, they're they're taking online bids, all this other shit. They're like, we're opening the bid at like you know ten thousand dollars. I'm like, what the? F-? It was like nuts. <laughs> and I thought it was gonna go for that little you know that yeah little right reserve they had in the book. I was such an idiot. So I just watched everything float away and all these people get all this cool shit. <laughs> and it was like it was kind of like a mini funeral for me. You know, yeah, it was a bummer. It was a bummer. It was weird. Yeah, it was weird it was... being there, like you know, towards the end and watching it kind of collapse it was it was really weird but um anyway so uh, i want to i want to hear more about you and how you you know what what your story is how you got into all this stuff as a kid and just you know where you're from and you're from new jersey right yeah yeah i'm from i'm from new jersey from north jersey up by manhattan you know i grew up like five miles west of new york city so i could like kind of see the world trade centers from my oh wow okay so I was I was pretty close to the city, which which was really cool. And, you know, it's a cool place to grow up. And you know, I, I was one of those I mean, cliche textbook like super, um, you know, supportive parents kids. You know, oh, my good. parents were cool, cool as hell. You know, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I my, had that too. My dad, yeah, yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I I think that's I think that's kind of a, a running thing with with people that are like really trying to to get to a specific level. They either mm-hmm. have that that support. Or they fought against the fact they didn't right. Have that. So <laughs> yeah, it's like, like one or the but, other, you know. Yeah, yeah. You're either feeding the parents were feeding the passion, or they were working against it to the point where it was like the passion grew even more right. out of control, you know. So I, I was lucky that my parents were cool. You know, my dad was really into monster movies and and you know genre stuff, fantasy action. Oh, cool. But the funny thing is, he he's super religious. So my dad is is a Catholic hardcore. Oh wow. So we grew up in a really Catholic household, but he still loved the art of like comic books and, and movies and stuff like RoboCop and predator and still were some of his favorite movies. So, you know, I kind of had that weird balance. That's that's cool though. I mean, if you can do, if that, I mean, that's what, that's how religious people should be. Then people would never problem. (laughs) You know, it's like, you can have, you can be religious. And as long as you can, you know, you can, you don't have to be like that just because you're religious. You know, it's like, I know a lot of really cool religious people, it's like you don't it doesn't mean you're an asshole necessarily you know? exactly exactly and he he's totally that you know he's he's that he's that guy he's like the the good kind of yeah you know, Catholic. right yeah yeah totally so i mean we butted heads about music about certain kinds of movies about right, certain kind of monster right. stuff you know growing yeah. up but but luckily now we're, we're pretty we're pretty cool with that but he still let me rent whatever i wanted you know let me read whatever comics i wanted the only thing that was was off the radar, I couldn't. It was I couldn't mess with D and D. That was like a big thing. <laughs> that was for the, for the in Catholics. the eighties. Like, in in the eighties, oh, yeah. that that was the satanic panic thing. I, I was just hearing people talk oh, yeah. about that. Like people don't realize that shit was people. You know that was really happening in the in the eighties. People oh, were yeah. scared of it. You know there was like big time videos going around uh, uh, that police departments put out and stuff that that showed like if your kid's into D and listens to heavy yeah. metal that they're devil worshipers and all this stuff it was crazy time man uh, and that was exactly me like i wanted monster manuals <laughs> yeah. and and heavy metal records like that's all i cared about right. so my dad was sort of like oh i hope you're not a satanist you know right. it was like it was pretty pretty funny i remember once he found he found the satanic bible in my bedroom once and i was just reading it because i was curious and right. that was like I, I might as well have burned the house down at that point you know what i mean like he just lost his shit but uh <laughs> but yeah, D and D was 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 off the table completely, and and like they would send pamphlets, like right. the, the archdiocese of Newark, like controlled that whole area of North Jersey, right? And they would send out pamphlets, like don't let your kids do D and D. It's basically Satanism, you know. But they also would send all these weird pamphlets out when the Exorcist came out. It was like the Catholic Church itself advised all good catholics to watch the film the exorcist that's what i was gonna say it seems like yeah it it was kind of pro-catholic that movie in a way it was very like exactly you know it was not anti-religious really you know 
Yeah, and uh, honestly, the, the whole theme is that the only thing that's going to protect you from this inevitable right. evil is is the belief in God, right? Yeah, right, So right. Catholics were, like, showing their kids these movies. So my dad <laughs> showed me The Exorcist at a ridiculously young age. I was, like, seven or eight or something like oh that. Like, and the, the crazy thing about it was I kind of liked it because it was scary, but at the same time, it was fucking me up so bad. I was, I was like freaking out all right but then at the end of the movie after all that like you're like put through the ringer you know and you're scared as hell he turned to me and he was like you know the crazy thing is this that's real like all of that's real that can actually (laughs) happen and that's when i like something like got knocked loose i was just like i i don't know man i I don't know if i can handle that one so head spin that like yeah totally the stuff that that messed me up that bad as a kid became the stuff I was obsessed with later in life. And I right. just like, I wanted, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be hooking up the hoses, shooting, you know, split pea soup at everyone. You know what I mean? So, so you're, I, you're probably too young to contact Dick Smith. Yeah, sort of. I mean, because I, that's you're so, too. you're so close. So, you know, relatively close to him and he's like the, the man or he was the man. He, he was the man. And I, I probably could have, right. Like, cause I mean, he was still on the East Coast at the time. He, he still had the Dick Smith course going. I, but I was just a little too stupid to read the fine print and all the ads in the back of Fango and stuff like that. Like, I didn't really know that there was a community of people that were available. You yeah. know, I, I, I really, I had no idea. I would read the articles. I would stare at the pictures. I'd like draw some of the, the monsters, you know, in, in my sketchbook. But I, I wasn't the type of guy that was going out and trying to find gm foam and you know right hitting up dick and, and you know locating the closest place to get pottery plaster like i wasn't that guy <laughs> i was playing wiffle ball and you know and and reading comic books and i loved all that monster stuff and that's what i knew i wanted to do that someday but i didn't realize i could start i mean guys oh, right. you know that, that are starting at 12 years old you know in, in their basements and stuff I, I unfortunately wasn't that guy i was like yeah. going through the motions the most, most art stuff I did was in school. You know, I, I was like allowed to just do whatever I wanted in class because I had a little bit of, of talent and they were like, yeah, yeah, just do whatever. Like all the other kids will do this, but you know, you get to oh, do that cool. project. It was cool. But at the same time, I was sort of like lazy. I was like, right. yeah, art, art is just a fun thing that I like to do. I mean, I do it <laughs> constantly. It's the only thing that keeps my attention. But at the same time, I wasn't serious about it. I didn't know what it was going to turn into. Right. And my dad's also a teacher. So, you know, my mom was a school nurse at a time. My mom was a nurse and, you know, my, my dad was a teacher, but he would also sing religious music on the weekends and stuff. So they had a really like kind of staunch idea of getting degrees and stuff, going to school, you know? So I wasn't a great student. I was like a D student in honors classes, you know? So I I just kind of got by, but I decided I was going to art school because that was how I, you know, I could do what I wanted to do, but I could still get the degree and make them happy. So that, that was the idea was I'd go to art school eventually. And I'm lucky that I did because a lot of people didn't go. They didn't have to go. I needed to go, right. I I needed the discipline. I needed to realize I need to take this serious. Now, if I had come out, you know, at 18, 19, you know, to LA, I would have been a meth head or something. I would have been nuts, you know, like some, <laughs> something would have went wrong. Right. So luckily I went to school. I went to the Art Institute of, of Philadelphia and okay. I studied industrial design technology there. And around somewhere in the, in the middle of my second year, I was like, wait a minute, I'm paying for this school. I, I need to start going to class. I need to start taking this shit seriously. <laughs> like, this is what I want, right? This is art. Like, what am, what am I doing? You know, right? So, so wait, so you're doing industrial design. What, what? How does that? Re- did you want know you wanted to be an effects artist at that point? Where you like, how does that relate? Yeah, yeah. How does that relate to working into effects? Well, that that's what's funny. The art institutes, which are basically like the the Ralphs, you know, or the Walmart of art schools, right? Uh-huh. They're just in every major city. You can sign up and just like show up, you know, to class and they're going to tell you you're an artist or whatever. Right. So in the, on the, in the back of, of, you know, Gore Zone and Fangoria, they had, you know, the Art Institute of Pittsburgh specifically would always, you know, advertise. Right. Yeah, right? yeah. But Pittsburgh was too far for me. Philadelphia was close uh, enough. Okay, right? So I was I like, see. I'll go there. But industrial design technology was this sort of like all encompassing, you know, an industrial 3D art program, basically. They did everything from furniture design 
product design, you know, materials and processes with mold making and things like mm. that, you know, but there was this one like tiny little like sub major of special makeup effects. Oh, and oh, trippy. In Pittsburgh, they had Savini, right. you know, they had uh, Jerry Gurgley. They had guys who, who worked out here, you know, uh, if, I think Volich did some time mm -hmm. there yeah. at, at one point. And so they had legit effects guys, you know, in Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh was too far. Again, I'm the lazy kid that doesn't know what he's doing with his, you know, life. You know, <laughs> I, all I know is I want to do monsters, you know? Right. So I, I go to Orange Studio Philadelphia. I study industrial design and, you know, you get a lot of sculpting, a lot of life drawing, a lot of stuff that I knew was going to be helpful, but then product design, you know, furniture design, things I knew I wasn't super interested in, right. but, you know, I just wanted to get that degree. I had a class though, a guy named John Stewart. Um, he, he's a, a local Philadelphia effects guy who just, I, he came West, but he never really, you know, made his way out to LA. Mm -hmm. uh, so he stayed, he stayed on the East coast and he just got this job at, at the school and he knew basically everything. And he would teach lessons right out of grand illusions and stuff, basically, you right, know? Yeah. And, and that was cool enough for me. Like that was my little experience, you know, do, doing makeup effects. And that's when I, started really working on you know my first one piece foam latex appliance and the first time i, I ever ran foam the, you know the first you know molds i made and stuff like that and um obviously like latex masks was was huge because that was the easiest right. thing yeah you know that was the it was the most comprehensive i, I kind of understand this i can take it from start to finish right and, right yeah, you know, yeah you're kind of honing the those skills Definitely. that would you know work in in, a, in an effects lab you know definitely so that was sort of lucky. I wound up getting a, a bachelor's degree there. And so everybody was sort of happy, even though I don't know, I don't know that the degree ever helped me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it helped you gig. with your parents. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It. And it, it helped me stack up, you know, uh, student debt for literally the rest of my life, <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. Right. But, uh, but I really needed that to mature. Like I needed yeah, to yeah. learn how to be an art student, you know, mm -hmm. which means, it doesn't end when class is over. It's like everything you look at, you have to try to absorb. And, you know, every person that you interact with, you know, you're looking at their face in a different way. You're trying to see things in a different way. I had to like, kind of teach myself how to be a good student. And, you know, people talk about you have shitty teachers. You know, I was like, I don't think there are shitty teachers. I think there's just shitty students because right. your teacher knows something. They worked somewhere. They learned something. And it's kind of your job to pull it out of them. You right. know, And that translated to when I was finally in the, in the, you know, the effect shops, like, how can I pull whatever I can out of these dudes, you know, if they'll let me, you know? And so mm -hmm. I would just like pick people's brains and stuff. And it, it just, it just sort of worked out. I'm lucky to have that experience. I don't think it's good for everyone to spend, you know, $50,000 going to some school that, you know, it might not help you, you know, especially if you have the talent and the discipline, but right. I, I had a little bit of talent. I had no discipline, you know? So. Well, you seem like a disciplined guy now. You're all buffed out and stuff. So you seem like you, you seem no, like you I, have this. I wish. <laughs> I, I wish man. enough I'm, discipline I'm to worst. work out and and uh, learn effects and all that stuff. I don't work out enough. I just eat a lot of sandwiches. <laughs> that's that's my problem. <laughs> so how did you? Uh, okay, so you got that degree. Then what was the next step for you as far as getting in the business? I mean, well, also well, let me ask you first. Uh, were you just like totally stoked in that when you were going to school for that? Cause that seems like it would be so much fun learning. I mean, that's like in a way, some of my fondest memories are like when I was teaching myself when I was like 13 and doing yeah, your yeah. first latex mask, you know, when you do it the first time, it's so exciting and fun that you, you're able to pull it off. So it's like, was were you totally enthusiastic and totally into, into being in the school learning effects? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. When when I finally was there, when I had sort of a grasp of it, when I, I when I had the discipline, you know, I, I actually I stopped drinking and, and messing around with drugs and stuff like that at that time as well. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm basically like completely sober, you know. So when I was about 20, I stopped drinking. So before I was even legal age, wow. I was kind of <laughs> over that that part of my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. I started kind of kind of young, you know, which right. also fed into not having the discipline, you know. Yeah, so, for sure once I had that kind of behind me and I, I, I started focusing uh, again, I was sort of lost in this. Like, I don't really know how to approach a career. So that's when I signed up for Savini school 
in Pittsburgh. So wow. I, I had already gotten a bachelor's degree and I thought I didn't have enough effects. I didn't know that I'm going to learn when I get out there. I'm, I just got to go to right. LA. I just got to start working. I had no idea. So I was like, what if I go to Savini school and I get that like bridge between art school and makeup effects. And ultimately the Dick Smith course was another thing that, that kind of brought me there. Cause at that point I was like, if I enroll in this school, I kind of automatically get into the Dick Smith course and I get actual FaceTime with Dick. So right. that was like a huge thing. So I went there, uh, obviously I'm a huge Savini fan as well. Mm. You know, I, I was a big fan of, of like the John Volich crew that did all the Babylon five, Everett Burrell, John Volich optic nerve stuff. Yep. And uh, Jerry Gurgley was one of the main uh, teachers there because they had stopped doing stuff at, at uh, Art Institute of Pittsburgh and they were doing everything in their own like, you know, school at this point. Mm -hmm. So I went, I went out there then. Uh, and there I was basically like the, the ultimate student sponge, like, you know, class ended at, at 3 p.m. I was there till 3 a.m., you know, right. and, and Jerry was cool with us. He'd let us stay and run foam all night. And we kind of had like unlimited materials. It was one of those things where it's like, I'm going to milk this for yeah, everything to work. That's smart. Yeah. So that was my, my first multi-piece makeup, you know, my, my first experience, you know, doing all kinds of um, uh, sculptures, maquettes, you know, different stuff, you know, take, taking mask making to, to a, a different level taking mold making to to another level you know my first matrix mold like just even learning what these terms are and right. what, what's going on i felt like i was more ready to go to la because i was shit scared i mean i'm in new jersey oh, yeah. like, I you can't, yeah. you can't be any further you know yeah no no I, it, I was scared going up from just from san pedro to to la yeah. which is like 45 minutes away and being away from home and trying to doing this new business it's scary so I can't, I can't even imagine yeah. coming from the East coast. It's like super scary. Yeah. <laughs> so I did like a little creep, you know, I, I went, I went, <laughs> you know, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. And then I just, I just went for it and I, and I came out and, you know, I, I, I just started shopping around, like go, going around and, and showing my book and I was walking into places I shouldn't have been walking into. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> they, they actually tell you too. like all my teachers were like, look, you got to call, you got to, I'm like, yeah. oh, fuck that. I'm just going to go walk in <laughs> and see what's up, you know? And sometimes it worked out. A lot of times it did not. And uh, people were like, you got to get out of here. I went, <laughs> I drove, I drove directly to Stan Winston studios from New Jersey, which is hilarious. <laughs> like I, I did my whole drive, you know, and I didn't even stop like where I was about to stay or anything like that. I didn't, I didn't get oh any food God. or whatever. Like when I finally got into, into Hollywood, I just went directly to the shop in, in Van Nuys and I just get out with my book. You know, I, I was like all cramped up from the ride. I'm like, Hey, you know, knocking on the door literally. And they opened like a crack and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm here. I'm here. Check out my book. You know, can I come in and see Pumpkinhead? You know, I want to see the display room. And they're like, no, man, we don't, we don't do that. You got to call, you got to make an appointment. Right. You got to talk to the right people. And I was, I was like, again, completely crushed i'm like what am i what what do you mean i just drove across the entire country like come on but, that's hilarious uh, yeah it was, it was crazy but you know howard Berger actually i did the same thing at kb when when they were in van nuys on on woman place i, I walked in there and again like the the you know girl at the front was like what is this guy doing i'm like i don't know like can i talk to anyone and howard just happened to be walking out of the offices at the time and he's like, yeah, come on, send him back. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll show him around. So he gave me a tour of K&B. Like, oh, that's you know, cool. Just like, yeah, no, no background, nothing like that. He looked at my book. He gave me some advice. It was, it was pretty awesome. And then they hired me only 13 years later. So that's like. <laughs> <laughs> you must have made a great impression. <laughs> I know, right? He was like, no, nah, that guy, keep him out. You know? <laughs> so did you have but, a place to stay and everything? Yeah, that's that's another crazy story. My dad, because of of the religious music, you know, my dad travels all over the world singing Catholic music, right? Oh, no way. He's got 20 something albums. You know, he, he legit, really if if there is a a subgenre of of Christian, but Catholic contemporary rock, my dad is like the top, like the Frank Sinatra, the Billy Joel of that world. But it's I a tiny know that little it, world. You know I didn't I mean? even know it existed. I didn't even know there was music like that. Yeah, it's it's kind of hilarious because 
you know, the, the, the Christian contemporary world, they're not, they're not into it because he's Catholic. Right. And the Catholics aren't super into it because they're too traditional for the rock, you know, what I mean? right. like, which is kind of, kind of funny, but, but, uh, so he's got connections all over, like, like literally all over the world. Right. So he, he puts out a call to his friends in Southern California. Hey, does anyone have a place to stay? My son's coming out there. He has no money. He's trying to break into this industry. He's got no connections, you know, and I wound up getting a place to stay at this tiny little house where these women who have, they're basically nuns for all intents and purposes. Like they, they are, they have given their life to the Lord and they have this little house with a chapel in the back. They have, you know, weekly mass at this place and connected to their garage is this one bedroom, you know, little studio room actually. Yeah. And I had a, a mattress on the floor and I stayed there for over a year. They let me stay there rent free. Were it you was all insane. Were you all tatted up at that point? <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Really? <laughs> and yeah. That, that's the funny thing about it. You know, and I, I probably had a big stupid beard at the time too. And like, <laughs> you know, I had mohawks at certain points. It's like, it's, it's just silly. And, the best part about it was I would help them out. I helped them with landscaping. I'd help them out with their sound system, you know, for, for their chapel. So it'd be <laughs> six, six AM on a Sunday. And these little Filipino ladies would be knocking on my door and they'd like, we need help with them, you know? And I would go out there, you know, basically in the, the clothes I was sleeping in, you know, and I'm fixing their, the speakers to their sound system while the whole congregation is, is waiting there. And oh they're like, God. who the hell is this guy? You know, it's like, <laughs> it was insane. But, but I, without that, I, I never would have been able to, to hack it because I couldn't afford a place. I could barely afford gas, right. you know, when, when it first came out. So I stayed there for a whole year. Wow. And then I, I couch surfed a little bit and, and I wound up, you know, just hooking up with people from, from, you know, the local shops and stuff like that, getting a good core group of friends that I worked with and that we all worked in the same circles. And then, you know, I, I, I could move in with them. So it was, it was pretty lucky though, but it was, it was funny. I actually <laughs> sculpted. I sculpted like a five foot Virgin Mary for, for their grotto. As a thank you. You know what I mean? Like just That's like cool. fun stuff like that. They're like, Oh, the monster kids back there sculpting the, the Virgin Mary. It's like, <laughs> yeah. You can't make that shit up. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty silly, but it was awesome. I, yeah. I was yeah. Glad. That's cool. Uh, so what was your first job in, in, in effects? Like what was your first gig? My first gig was, was actually when I was in high school, you know, I, I actually, I was 15 and, um, I found out that, that Vinnie Gostini had a small shop in Wayne, New Jersey, that he was just sort of renting for Kevin Smith's movie dogma. Oh, no so, way. Yeah. My parents, you know, drove me over there and they were just like, Hey, you know, our, our son is, is into this stuff. You know, can you check out, you know, his sketchbook and stuff. I had a sketchbook. I had a couple pictures of, of some sculptures I had done at the time. And I was just like excited to be there. Like all, all these cool dudes, you know what I mean? Right, Vinny yeah. Gostini and, and, and uh, Vincent Skeegee and, and um, um, just a, a bunch of different people. Uh, Louis Sicarian, you know what I mean? From Saturday Night Live. Uh -huh. I mean, these guys, to me, they're, I was like, these guys are cool as shit. I walk in and they had <laughs> Evil Dead 2 on the, you know, I'm like, oh man, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> so they, they let me hang out. I started just like kind of sweeping up the shop and stuff. And then they let me do a couple things like run polyfoam. And, you know, they let me pre-paint stuff, just, just putting one color down right, so that I could pass it off to, to somebody that, you know, that knew what they were doing and stuff. And it, it was, it was insane. So that was my sophomore year basically was was working on dogma and wow. the cool thing about it was Vinny called you know months later after they finished like principal photography in pittsburgh they, he called and he's like hey i need i need the the spelling of your name for the credits and i was like get the fuck i like freaked out like, right. no way. Like, <laughs> and they actually got me in you know i, I got oh, my first cool. credit at 15 which was insane you know that's amazing but, uh yeah, yeah I was, he's an I, awesome was, and, he's a he's a cool guy Oh, dude, he's awesome. And he's yeah. so much fun. And like, I, that's, I was already sure that this is what I want to do. But after meeting those guys and like, I'm like, I, I need to be in these shops. You know, I, I went kind of a roundabout way by doing art school, two different right. schools and then coming back. But you know, I, it, it happened. And uh, <laughs> I think the first, the first thing, the first legit thing I worked on out here was uh, pushing daisies, a, te a television show for um, Rick Lazzarini. Oh, like, okay. Lazzarini hired me you know just he just needed extra hands you know we we're working on on 
those uh, Foster's Farms chicken puppets and stuff like that. All oh, right. <laughs> and a couple of pushing daisies was was another thing. We made that that kind of like mechanical um, wooden hand. I don't know if you ever saw that show. No, but, I didn't. Yeah, little little silly things like that. And then uh, I was at Mungles for a little while. Oh no way! Yeah, I wor- yeah, yeah. I worked uh, with him like one of my first things through Cinema yeah. Secrets because one of the first jobs I got was working at Cinema Secrets and oh, um, nice, nice. like as a stock boy and it's like I didn't I was not into it um, but it was like you know this is the step stepping stone like Marie Stein was like work here do this I'll get you in movies and uh, and and uh, I ended up like doing some designs for Matthew uh, for like a like a, a Yeti design for a tv commercial just weird stuff like that but i remember he let me come to his house and showed me how to mix just how he was doing foam latex and he was the first guy that showed me like if you put too much of the chemical in your thing you could you could take a a a paper towel rolled up and stick it in the chemical that you poured in to get a little teeny bit out and i was like wow that's so cool (laughs) you know just like these little tips soak it up he was such a nice guy he was really really oh dude so anyway, I didn't awesome. mean to interrupt. So you you were no, working, no, dude. working for him and yeah, on, same, uh, thing, same thing. He he would take he would just take people in, take you know the young dudes that didn't really have you know any other options at the time. Like, hey man, we need we need some extra people. We need you know. Right. And the shit I learned there, I learned so much stuff. It was it was just, it was awesome, you know. Yeah. And uh, we were working on uh, House MD and and CSI and uh, you know a couple of shows like that. And luckily every once in a while he'd send you to set with one of the one of the bodies you know oh cool and just basically <laughs> body wrangling and stuff and that was like the first time i actually got to be on a legit set and i was freaking out you know right. like this is like all happening like it's like this is these this is what you've been wanting to do since you're a tyke you know and it's kind of crazy so i uh we did csi and that was at universal so i remember uh, as a little kid coming out and going to Universal and riding the tram, right? You know, and like be, being so pumped, and then you see people working in the studios, right. and you're like waving at them, you know, and they never wave back at you. <laughs> so I was the guy working on CSI, waving at the kids as the tram's going by, and there's always like grips and like gaffer dudes looking at me like this. Fuck, look at this asshole. <laughs> He's actually waving at the tram, and I'm like, oh fuck you guys. Like I, this is like a dream come true, you know? It's like it was insane. Oh man. But, uh, yeah, it was cool, man. I got a lot of opportunities there. You know, my first like legit life cast and stuff I, I was doing there, learning more materials and getting better at, at mold making, you know, even though I never, never got great at it, but right. <laughs> yeah, it, it was cool. It was a cool opportunity. And then, uh, then ADI was, was big. Like that was a big moment for me was getting into ADI. Like, mm. you know, I, I basically got in and I was cataloging Photoshop designs for the design room. You know, mm-hmm. so you had these guys making all this cool stuff. And I, I was just like literally just cataloging them in little <laughs> folders and stuff. And that was my first gig at ADI. And I, I went through every single department besides hair, because I don't think I could ever do that, you know, for any, right. for anyone, but every single department just helping out, helping out, helping out until Steve Frakes took me into the mold shop and was like, all oh, right, Steve now. Frakes. I remember Steve yeah, Frakes. Yeah. yeah. I worked with him at Altarian. He's the man, dude. Yeah. I mean, he's been around, you know, that guy, he's kind of a legend. He's worked yeah. on, on tons of stuff and uh, just an awesome guy. Another guy that's like willing to take you under his wing and show right. you what's up. And, and he was tough too. He was like, you know, on us about, about doing shit right. So that was cool. And um, I still, I work with him here. He's at, he's at KB, you know? Oh, really? It's just an awesome dude. Tell him and I said hi. The one guy. If you see, oh, next time you see him. Definitely. I haven't seen him yeah. in a long time. I'll hey, see you tomorrow, man. Cool dude. <laughs> awesome. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah he, he was one of the only people, too. Like, he knew what was up. I told him, like, oh, I'm going to be a sculptor, you know? And he was like, look, man, the best sculptors know how this mold-making shit works, right. you know? And you have to understand the foundations if you're going to do this stuff. So, I mean, I, you know, he, he really – it was it was tough on me, but he actually – believed in me also he was he was one of the guys i was like look you will do it you'll sculpt he's like i can tell you just got to keep going and, and and pushing it but while you're here you know try to take this seriously and realize that it's going to make you a better sculptor right. and now, again i had to think again like oh shit yeah i, I gotta absorb as much as i can 
from this guy, from the mold shop, you know, from the sculptors that are on hand here. And, you know, it just, it just helped. And eventually they gave me my shot at, at sculpting, you know, what, what was it on? What was the show that you, they let you sculpt on? Well, and what, it's, what, it's what was the of, thing that you sculpted on? What was the sculpture? It was, and this is, this is sort of weird. I, I always say all of my career dreams have come true, but in the shittiest way possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like worst, worst case scenario, you know? So they did a remake or sort of a remake, like a prequel thing, the thing, the John Carpenter's thing. Oh yeah. In yeah. 20, <laughs> yeah. In 2011, they did a prequel, right? So I got, we were up for that. My... We were up for that. Yeah, Spectral yeah. was up for that doing, I was, I did some designs for that. Yeah. I do everyone. I, I was trying to get a piece of yeah. that. Like everybody yeah. was on it, you know? So I was so excited. I'm like, this is my first chance. I'm like actually getting paid to sculpt because most people will let you sculpt if you do it for free. Right. So, <laughs> you know, I, I won't name any names, but a lot of people got sculptures out of me, you know, for free right. before this one gig, which was, you know, whatever it is what it is. Yeah. And uh, so that was like a dream come true. I, I'm working on a, the, the thing I'm connected to the most legendary creature effects movie of all time in some weird right, way. Yeah. I'm part of the, I'm part of the timeline in some way, right? Yeah. It sucks that it turned out to be one of the shittiest movies. <laughs> I I've know. Ever, I've ever seen. I couldn't even yeah. make it through. I was so bummed. I, oh, you know dude, what though? It's... I knew when uh, uh, we met with the uh, the director and maybe a producer. I knew it was going to be bad as soon as we met with oh, them yeah. because you could just tell that they weren't into the original. They weren't into the oh. Carpenter version. It was like. They just didn't have that kind of respect for it or the reverence that all of us had for that movie. And it was like, yeah. oh, you guys picked the wrong person to do this. <laughs> Definitely. You know, and, that, and that's the one thing you should have if you're tackling a project like that. If they, yeah. I mean, that's the only thing you need to have. And that's right. the first thing. I remember at one point they were like, less crab claws, no more. What is all this crab shit? And I'm just like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just... Bummer, it was man. like heartbreak. <laughs> so so but were at you the same were... time i was you know i was excited yeah yeah I'm, no like... i'm yeah i even even after that it's like i was still hoping we got the gig just to be able to work on that but even if the movie sucked it would be yeah. still be cool to be part of the history and and it's like you know such cool kinds of effects for a, a movie like that you know um just so weird oh, yeah. and twisted um were you working with paul komoda yeah, yeah, Paul Komoda, um, Casey Love, Tim oh, Martin, wow. um, yeah, Davis Fandino, uh, Mio Nakamura. Um, it, it was it was awesome, man. And and Steve Koch, you know, Steve oh, Koch yeah. was sort of like wrangling us and, and, and art directing most of the stuff and, and mm -hmm. you know keeping everybody in line. So it, it, <laughs> dude, it was it was insane, man. It was like it was I was like getting a real taste of it and going like this is what it's going to be. And I, I learned a big lesson that look. You're not gonna like most of the shit you work on, yeah. but you're gonna you're gonna love you're gonna love these little snippets of time where you worked with certain people, right. you learned things from certain people, you worked on something that you got through that was cool, and you know they actually yeah. put it on camera. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be a lot of disappointment, you know. Yeah, that, yeah. The movie's a probably huge yeah. lesson. <laughs> yeah. The, the, don't count on the movie being any good, but you could still have it's still fun sculpting some cool monster, even if it doesn't get in the movie. Yeah or the movie sucks, which is usually the case, uh, you know, it's still, it's, it's still fun. You know, the sculpting, sculpting is fun. I think, you know, it's like, I enjoyed oh, it's it. a blast. Man. And that's another, that's another thing where I had to, I had to kind of train my mind, you know, as much, as much as like my hands to, to work and like, look, you know, what is, what are you getting out of this moment, out of this project? Like, Maybe I don't like this design that I have to sculpt. Maybe I right. hate this idea. I think it's a terrible script. It's, a, it's a ter going to be a terrible movie. But what can I learn from this? Well, maybe I can learn you know, mm -hmm. how to put a little more weight in my wrinkles on this one. You know right. what I mean? And I'm that close to, to Steve Koch. I could be like, hey, Steve, like, you know, how do you do this or what's going on? And, he, you know, see how he does it and at least get that out of it. You right. know, how can I? I, you know, my eyelids are too thick. I got to work on my eyelids. Why are my eyelids so thick? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it's like all, all of those little things, like just if I can learn one thing with every one of those projects, yeah, I, I can't stand hard surface stuff. I'm terrible at it. Mm -hmm. But 
I need to get better at it. So let me, let me just like put right. my head down and jam on this thing. And it turned into that for me where like those little moments were little lessons I could learn, you know? And, you know, I, luckily I had people that helped along the way. I mean, Jordan was a huge help for, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, I, he, I took his class, um, the first year when I came out 2007, I think it was 2006, 2007. And from there on, you know, he just sort of like helped me out. Like I'd, I'd come by the shop, you know, he'd give me little jobs to do here and there. Sometimes he, he'd let me kind of like go sculpt with him. He'd sculpt mm-hmm. half of something and let me do the other half. I try oh, to match cool. his style, you know, things like that. And, and the whole time I was really being like, you know, conscious of like, I'm, I'm, I have to be like a Xerox machine. Right. I have to like implant some of this stuff in my brain because I'm not getting, you know, any other opportunities to do something like that. Here I am. I have to try to match one of his wrinkles or, yeah. or you know, a nostril or something like that. Yeah. You know? It's like, that that was huge for me though and that i took that into my other jobs yes he actually got me that gig on on the thing because i had worked at adi for five i think five years at that point but they never let me sculpt you know and then they wound up calling jordu while i was there working on designs with him for the thing Uh i was just sort of helping you know building armatures and and cleaning some things up here and there for jordu and he's like look i can't come over there i'm already working on the thing and working on designs i can't be there but would you consider Mikey? He's over here and I, I think he's good enough. And that just that thumbs up from him was wow. enough for them to be like, all right, all right, it's time. <laughs> let, let him come over and we'll see what he can do type of shit. So I'm lucky, lucky to have that opportunity. Yeah. Too. Like, I mean, I learned so much from him and then for him to pass me on and kind of go, okay, I, th- I think he can do this. You know? Right. Yeah. That, that counts for a lot, you know, especially from someone of his level of sculpture you know he's pretty legendary oh, yeah. his sculpting is, is amazing he's fast as hell too um, yeah his speed i learned a lot of that from from him too like trying to you know think about speed now you know and and, mm-hmm. and try, trying to get faster which is a huge part of it people don't realize that yeah you know? yeah but yeah that's the thing it's like you know once you master a certain level of sculpting like a certain um uh once you get a certain once you could hit a certain level of quality in your sculpture, the next challenge is like, okay, how can I do this as efficiently as possible? You know, really yeah. rather than picking at it. Cause it's like, you know, you can, it's easier to, to do something amazing when you just don't have any time constraints and you could just noodle it forever. Oh, yeah. But it's like, you know, then, then, then there's a certain point when it, where the challenge becomes efficiency and time and, and uh, you know, how much you can kind of get away with uh oh, yeah. blocking things out and stuff um yeah and then yeah. every time you you like hit one of those those like kind of plateaus there's always another peak you have to hit after mm-hmm. that and I, I like juggle back and forth it's like all right well i got a little bit better with technical stuff and maybe some realism stuff now i'm going to try to get efficiency and speed to that right and then once you get there you're like now i have to work on more realism and get right. more realistic and, and, and work on my technical stuff my my textures and stuff like that and then it just keeps going and keeps going. And that's like, to me, there is no limit. Like you will always mm-hmm. have something to learn, you know, and you know, I have that like white belt mentality, like a forever white belt. Like I always have to learn because, you know, that I guess that's the only point of doing art in my brain is right. like to get better, whatever yeah. that means. Not, co- not comparing yourself to other people, but comparing yourself to yeah, get better. You yeah, exactly. Get better than you were, you know. <laughs> I yeah, and yeah. I think like a guy I, I, I used to trip out on a guy like Mitch who had kind of like mastered everything. He would oh, yeah. the the thing he would do towards the you know as he was as uh he you know because he got to a point where he, he could do anything as good as it could be done. And so yeah. he would experiment with just doing things in a different way, just be just be just to break things up and not be monotonous and boring so it's like he would try just new techniques or new ways of doing things or new cat brushes or dog he always had like the yeah. weirdest little gizmos that you would never think of to use for for, for sculpting <laughs> you know it's uh so it's like i think i think because it's like you know you know how he was like just complete <laughs> so super cynical and complained about yeah, yeah. the job constantly like he was not enjoying it at all and uh i think you know to keep himself interested he would 
just do things differently, you know, just try to do things. Oh, yeah. He was always innovating in that way. And you see that from like guys like Kazu, you know, where oh, it was yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. It's like, they're always trying to do something better than they did it the last time, you know, which is super oh, yeah. inspiring to be around. And when you, when you see that guys on that level that are trying to, right. to get better, it's like that, that, in, in, in a nutshell the entire philosophy like it's like yeah that's what you should be doing that yep. that's it if you never make a dime or if you know if nobody ever knows who you are or whatever that's all secondary if you're if you're just getting better and you can look back and go like yeah i actually did this better than the last time and more efficiently you know i mean that that's so huge mitch always had some like you're saying some cat brush or some piece of something. A weird I, piece of like, plastic what? or really, yeah. Yeah. like a like, shoe what polish is that? brush what? or something. <laughs> exactly. He took he took one of those like coarse brushes off the Gojo, you know, that that pumice, you know, uh, um, hand soap that, uh, that, that, that they have. They have like a scrub brush on there for your nails. Right. And he took it and he cut into these little weird pieces to the point where I didn't even know what it was. I'm like, what the hell is this? He's like, He's like, don't worry about it. And he cut an even smaller piece off and gave it to me. He's like, here you go. So I'm like, I don't even know what this thing is. I don't know. I don't know if I can ever find it again. And I, I still have that tool because I'm like, I, I use it all the time and I can't lose it because I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know where I can find it again. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It's like, he would get, he would make tools for like the weird things that you, you know, like getting texturing, like the inside of a nostril or the corner here, or like, in a fold of an ear like the, the, yeah. there's always these weird hard places to get and he would have like a special tool that you only use for that one thing but it's like perfect. oh yeah it was like he would somehow figure figure out the perfect tool yeah. for that one little thing the perfect length the perfect depth yeah. and all that stuff. <laughs> I, I remember matt matt rose he, he had this tool and he showed it to me he's like he's like here's the the wrinkle depth tool like this is like oh yeah next yeah, level yeah. Shit. And I'm, and I'm thinking, man, he's kind of like Mitch because he's got his own tools as well. But he goes, no, 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 this is a Mitch tool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, shit. <laughs> so you got Mitch tools too, which is hilarious. I mean, Matt had his own tools, but right, right. that was a specific Mitch tool. <laughs> so he, he made me ask Mitch how to make it. So I was like trying to make this tool based on what Matt told me about Mitch's tool right. is hilarious. But <laughs> I still, I still use that stuff. And then you get obsessed because you're like, well, this is a tool I can never live without. So right. now I have to make 10 of them and then yeah. I have to make 10 more of different scale. Yeah. So I can like use this you know, if I have to do bigger stuff or smaller stuff and you just become as obsessed as, as these maniacs are, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it's like, pretty awesome though. Yeah. You get obsessed about the tools almost as much as the sculpting, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. My wife is hilarious. She'll bring, she'll bring sculpting tool, sculpting tools home for me. She'll see something at, at like, you know, a, a Ralph's or something and go, Hey, it's a sculpting tool. You know, I can, I can tell because she sees any little, she's in the makeup counter, you know, in, 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 uh, in target or something like that. And she'll right. see some weird scrub silicone scrub brush. And like, <laughs> oh, it's a sculpting tool. I'm like, Oh, awesome. You know, it's hilarious. <laughs> she knows how my brain is working. Like yeah. every little thing is a potential sculpting tool. Yeah, totally. That's how you got to be. You know, that's how the greats are. Uh, yeah, it's it's insane, man. And you guys with your textures. I mean, there there's a picture of of a skull with like a like skin just sort of stretched over it. You know that that I you know I probably got off off of your portfolio on your website or something like that. But there's a skin texture, like a chicken skin texture, that's on there that's so perfect. And I'm like little things like that, or things I've seen you know Mitch do or, or mm -hmm. Matt do these little these textures that are like how the f i don't even know how yeah, that that's doesn't make any sense you know yeah that, i mean all that, that one are you talking about the haunted mansion zombies yeah yeah it, it must have been some haunted mansion because yeah, there was I, I think i know if it's a haunted mansion zombie i know which one you're talking about because there's one i did that like specifically looked like it had chicken skin on it yeah and that it's was, got the the skin is like yeah paper thin, stretched yeah, over like yeah, the, yeah. The teeth that stuff. was like my favorite one that was my favorite one of the, the zombies it was so much fun i that's what, like those were all these background zombies i don't even think they were featured but yeah. i always for some reason i guess maybe i don't know maybe because i was working with all the best people around me and i was the newest guy there but um yeah. you know like kazu matt and mitch would get like the key characters and i'd always get these background characters but 
I love that because there was less, um, the standard Rick still had that high quality standard. So it had to be as good as their stuff, but, yeah. but there was no pressure because they were background masks. So I wasn't getting oh. a lot of like design, uh, influence from anybody really, because it weren't that important, but I was still into just like mastering the, the texture and stuff. And, and that's the one thing I learned, like, man, if you could see the stuff I did from before I started working at Rick's and after it was like a huge jump and it was um uh a lot it was mainly from Mitch it was like refining the forms really refining forms before you go into texture and uh yeah, yeah. and then how he did his detailing and like the the bump you know hitting the at an angle with the needle to make the bumps oh, yeah, and yeah. his clay slurry you brush the yeah. clay slurry back in it's like how do you even he had like the mixer, you know, 70% alcohol oh, yeah. and clay. And then you put it in the mixer. It's like, and then the, he'd get it like perfect. This perfect clay slurry that, you know, if it was, if you didn't, if you use 99% alcohol, it was different or however he made it. He had like the perfect formulation for it. But, but it was like, I could, I, before I worked there, I didn't know that you could get uh, detail that good until I saw Mitch's stuff in person, working with him. I was like, I didn't even think that was possible. And he was doing yeah. stuff as good as a life mask right next to it. You know, as realistic as a yeah. life mask, which is, you know, super delicate and crazy. The whole, the whole thing for me was always like the illusion of that texture. Like, right, Oh yeah. Exactly. You, gotta, you gotta make it sort of read like it's right, there, but it's right, not really right. there. But his, his stuff and Matt, it was the same. Yep. Like his stuff, it's there. It's yeah, actually yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. Like it's gotta it be as good like as the took, real thing. Yep. Yeah, you, you took someone's face and painted it like the right. color of clay. Like it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And I mean that that chicken thing with the slurry. I mean, then he'd go over it with another the, cat with brush. The cat brush. And, yeah. And, and I'm like, dude, are you insane? You're gonna ruin all the amazing shit you just did. But it was always right. And I, dude, to this day, I've tried it so many times. I think I've done it effectively twice. Yeah, like, it's uh, hard. Where to I was do. actually like. I was actually like yeah this is good this is this is actually yeah. okay <laughs> twice i mean i and i i still to this day can't go back and nail it again i i don't have any confidence with that slurry it's, it's, yeah. it's hilarious man. yeah <laughs> it's really difficult i it, that's that was like you know i i felt like you know by the time i was at the end of my rick's period um you know because like it's so funny. It's funny that Mitch comes up a lot in this conversation just because he's the he's the sculpting guy, you know, for oh, yeah. anybody who's worked for everybody knows Mitch is the guy. But he's the reason or one of the big reasons I got into fine art, because up to that point, I was still kind of like cool with effects. And it's like he, he and, and I got started working with Mitch and then he would just talk shit constantly just oh, about yeah, that, yeah. you know. He, he took it too far you know i i don't think it was accurate really it it was it was too extreme i think but he was just yeah. like about being disrespected and blah 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 you know he's always complaining and that was one of the things um that got me like thinking about being a fine artist and he was the guy who like i was telling him i was thinking about it he was like my biggest cheerleader for for getting into fine art like he was always super supportive all, always he was like the main guy that was because i was working with him i was working right next to him and so we were talking every day for five years you know and so oh yeah you know when i get a show finally get in a group show or something or i show him my paintings and he was like oh man and he was like so encouraging it was it was really cool and, and i feel like um i was able to leave effects because i because of working with him he taught me like the last kind of things that I didn't really know how to do well, which was like, like I said, it was really refining things and, um, and detailing to this certain level. So I felt oh, like, yeah. so I felt satisfied as a sculptor in effects, leaving it. Like, I didn't feel like I left it before I reached my peak or whatever. You know what I mean? Oh, so, yeah. so that was kind of cool that, I, that, you know, he's, he's just a real key figure for me and, and um, my effects career and in my art career too you know oh big time he, dude he's he was like the biggest advocate of, of yours he would talk about you all the time like as 
as someone who almost like <laughs> got out of the prison, you know what I mean? Right. Like, he, like Chet escaped. He is, he did it. He made it, you know? And I, here I am, here I was trying to come into this. Right. Business, yeah. Looking at guys like you, it when when you're in your effects career as like the top of the mountain, like, I just want to be like that. Yeah, we're trying to get I out. Be like Mitch. You're trying, you're on your way out. Mitch is like hating every second of it and talking shit the entire time. And I'm just like, yeah, but I like this stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and they're just like, oh. Yeah, I remember I would, I would come in and be like, I want to talk about Beekler with Mitch. I'd be like, hey, man, troll. And he's like, don't even fucking start. Like, he, he was so, he hated all that shit. He would talk shit constantly. And I love that. I remember yeah, right. at, I'm at Henson's, right? Which is already, that's like a dream come true. I'm at Henson's and I'm talking to John Criswell and Mitch Devane. And I bring up John Beekler. And the two of them just unload on me. Like, they really like beat the shit out of me. And and Criswell said he's like he's like you like troll I'm like I fucking love troll like you don't understand man like that's like a next level like that that movie changed my life and he's like yeah you should just kill yourself now kid and I was like what the fuck like, what is I'm like that's brutal that was brutal I mean they were joking obviously, yeah yeah but right right it's like that that level of like disrespect for their <laughs> early years you know what i mean and how dare i be interested in you know right like right so or savini or anything you bring up savini around oh yeah like, yeah they just that, but that's the shit that got me into know? it too it's like uh yeah. dawn of the dead the 78 dawn of the dead was like that was the one that was like i gotta learn how to do this i got obsessed seeing those effects because they at the time and they still i think i still think i still think they hold up that arm bite the neck by shoulder bite i mean those are great Me too. and um you know there's some bad stuff in there too but but uh but of course yeah. but it's like i had the grand illusions book i was like a fan I, I i thought the stuff he was doing was really cool but man you bring it up to mitch and he's like he was just so he's just so bitter against all of that all of that fandom i guess yeah. but but um <laughs> But but that's it also happens being in the industry a long time, you know, uh, you, oh, yeah, it makes you more cynical about those things. Yeah, and it's it's hard to not get bitter. And, and you know, there's times where you're disrespected and, mm -hmm. and it's the film industry as you know, right. not so much the creature creature effects industry, but the film industry itself. It doesn't lend itself to it's not like a meritocracy. You know what I mean? It's like right. it, 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 there's it's weird. And, and right. it, I understand the, the bitterness. I understand it. But. I also kind of pride myself in being like the, I want to be the super posy guy that shows up and goes, mm -hmm. no, nah, man, this is fun. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. This shit, right. And a lot of times, like you kind of see even those guys, you know, as, as, as bitter and crusty as, as they seem, <laughs> they're having fun, you know? Sometimes yeah, they're just I know. Fun. And they you won't know? admit and, it. And it was, they won't admit yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> they You have to like yank it out of them. You know what I mean? Like right. it was crazy. You know, my, Miles Tevis was there too at, at the same time. And he's another one. Like he, mm -hmm. he, he tries to be all crusty, but you know, at the end of the day, he, he loves this stuff. And yeah. there's no reason to get into this business if you don't love it. You know, right. even if it turns into, you know, your, your escape route and doing, you're still doing monsters and stuff. Right, you're still right. involved in art and you still love that. Right. And that's what I love about, about your podcast, right? Is, you know, you, you talk like I escaped, like, like the creature effects world was this jail or this like <laughs> kind of de desolate wasteland that you had, like you had conquered, you know, <laughs> which in a, in a way feels bittersweet to me. Cause I'm like, Oh man, I yeah. love it though. And I, you know, I, but at the same time, you know, you still, I can tell you love it. And when you speak right. about it, yeah, like yeah. that was a very important part of your life and Holy. an important part of, of your growth as an artist. And 100%. like you say, like, you know, somebody like mitch the things you learned from him took you basically to the ceiling in this industry and you were able to take what you learned there and put it into your painting and dude that's that's what i love about your artwork is that i see the the sculpture in makeup like, effects people yeah if you're a makeup effects oh, yeah. sculptor especially you can you can tell that that's my background it's like it's totally oh, in the paintings time. Uh, yeah the 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 you know the way that the textures and the, uh, <laughs> and the wrinkles and just the fleshiness of everything and how yeah. round the you know everything is you then your understanding of light i don't think it comes naturally like you have to actually be looking at three-dimensional objects right. and creating three-dimensional objects tell, yeah to understand light that way yeah. you know and, yeah when you're sitting around sculptures all day and you're moving a lamp around it's like it gets imprinted in your brain how light 
yeah yeah i always say it was like the best art school ever was was makeup effects and and i have to you know i have to uh i think that you being into it is totally cool and for me it was like it was like uh i just in in one in one way i loved it so much that i got super disappointed at at all the bullshit movie industry bullshit so so it was like that was part of what made me bitter is like oh i love this so much and they're taking all the fun out of it but um you know with all the bullshit but it was also just like the pat my personal path you know was to yeah. was to do my own thing for whatever reason my personality type or whatever and after get you know i've said this on the podcast many times it's like once i got it was almost like i had to get really negative about it at the end in order to leave it and 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 have the courage to try and do, do something else and after like a year away from it I realized it was like, it was such the best job ever. It's like, how could I have ever complained about this? And, uh, and I still, you know, totally miss sculpting every day. I mean, that's like, it's super fun. It's super fun. I love, oh, you know, whether you're, you're hanging out with people, you're talking and stuff, or even like just getting in the zone by yourself with your headphones and just like totally getting, I mean, I just love the feeling of clay and a tool yeah, and, yeah. The, and the and the putting the pre a certain amount of pre i just love it i love the sculpting process um so it's, so i'm not you know as much as i talk shit it's like i still yeah. do have that love for it for sure you know and and appreciation yeah. which is why i have you guys on the podcast because it's like you know i i think it's cool that you guys are still doing it and i also felt like you know not that that's the reason I left, but I also felt good about leaving so that, you know, other people could come in like a younger generation could come in and, and, yeah, you know, yeah. do, do it, you know, cause I had my time in it. So, you know, you guys should have your time in it too. And, uh, uh, and that that's huge, man. The, just the fact that you, that you recognize that is, is huge because, you know, it, 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 it means a lot, you know, that the next generation can come in you know, and, and look back at, at the stuff you did and go, holy shit, man, like I, I need to reach that. How do I do that? You know, and th that's my little journey. You know what I mean? Right. And I, mm. I, I, I love, I love the fact that, you know, you have your career now you know, as a, as a fine artist, you know, and, and the whole dark art movement and everything like that, because that's the next level of this right. for you. you know yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's totally. not, it's not, it's not disconnected in any way. Right. You know? I agree. And, and you are sculpting like, I, like I'm saying, well, you're sculpting with paint and that inspires me again. So now I am actually looking at your paintings and trying to incorporate stuff from there <laughs> in my sculpture. You know what that's I'm saying? That's cool. Yeah. And, that's cool. And, oh, definitely, man. And, and it's funny because you have, I have like, I have this obsession with with reference that started with Mitch as well, right? He he told me, oh, yeah. you know, no artists are only as good as their reference, right? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I, I took that a certain way, and then I became a little obsessed with it, and I needed I needed <laughs> reference everywhere. I didn't know what an ear looked like unless mm -hmm. I was looking at it, you know what I mean? But it it kind of helped, you know, in a way. And I have other little things. I started to realize that I just want to nail the idea or like a concept somewhere that's in this this other sculpture or other art or something like that i'm not copying that but i need it to be there as an inspiration oh yeah it's and important one the of reference those things right crucial. as you know the the rick baker troll right i mean yeah everyone's yeah like, same the holy grail you that's know? how i learned like, my I, ears <laughs> totally like I, I sometimes i'll just have that up there i might be sculpting like a squid monster right, yeah, but yeah. i have the troll there just as like a a weird like litmus point where i can hit like the barometer of cool i'm trying you right. know and you know your work is like that too I, I take a few paintings something that that inspires me that that you did and just have it there on on my laptop and it's oh, like that's cool <laughs> not even in the same world but i i know that like that's I'm going in that direction i need it to be in this like realm of cool you know what oh, I mean? that's cool i appreciate uh, that that's awesome yes so think about how i mean I can't be the only person doing that. So you're connected to creature effects. Like you're tethered to it forever. Right. Like, you know, whether, <laughs> whether you like it or not, you know what I mean? No, it's, it's like, cool. Just, I, I've, yeah. I've, yeah, I've come to it. Um, it's so, I, I swear it was like, it was, it was from being around Mitch for five years. I got so <laughs> anti, 
anti oh my god i I had his attitude and and um uh and when i got out it's like even when i was starting my art career i would never talk about effects it was so stupid it's like and and as as i as time went on um i realized it's like people are interested in effects like they want to know that i have a background in effects it's interesting it's as an artist you're kind of supposed to um talk about what makes you unique and, and your history and stuff. And I like, I missed out on year, like 10 years. I didn't talk about it. I was, cause I was like stupid. Like I was like, I'm going to make it as a fine artist without, you know, without anything. Yeah. And it's a shitty industry, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and, and, you know, like I said, like after I had the, you know, I'm ta- I left, I think maybe 2009 ish on land, land of the lost. And I, and, and that's when I, I got, cause I got laid off at spectral and, um, and instead of looking for another job, I was like, okay, I'm going to try this art full time. But I had been trying from like 2000 or the early 2000s to make it happen, doing art shows and stuff. And, um, but I just realized, you know, once I got out of the industry for a while, I realized like how stupid that was because it's because people are like, oh, I saw your name in a movie. And it's like, I was making the path so much, take so much longer because I wasn't talking about all this history I had in effects. And so now it's like, I'm something I'm proud of. And and I, and I, it's part of like my history as an artist, you know? Um, Oh yeah. Cause I still, I still love that stuff. I really do. I think it's cool. I think it's uh, I I'm like, I geek out on it. I I see your guys sculptures and like, I was looking at your website and it's like, you know, makes me miss doing that again. That's the other thing I want to talk to you about was the, uh, the uh, mask sculpting you do, which is like, you have it like as another the halloween industry kind of mask stuff i so love that shit i that's yeah, it's like me in a way i kind of miss that as much or more than the effects stuff because there's not like there's limitations like you have to make a neck thicker than you'd like but there's not limitations yeah. on like how it gets mechanized and how, what the expression needs to be so that it can move a certain way it's like you have it's like yeah. more sculpture sculptural in a way ma- halloween masks and it's like in my fantasy world, I could make masks again. I'd have a mask shop because it's like <laughs> it's. I just think that stuff is so fun. Like I totally get why Jordu does oh, yeah. it, and you know, uh, 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 a few other places do it. Like, what's the? So you work for you do sculptures for uh, Trick or Treat? Is that what it's, is, is studios? Yeah, yeah. I've I've basically worked with every mask company that mm. that's out there. You know, right now. Oh wow. You know, I. I worked for the the big holy three in my in my you know in my world was uh, Don Post Studios right towards the end. Unfortunately, oh, okay. I know I'm always too late for everything, but <laughs> I got I got two or three masks in there before they close their doors. You know, I, I worked for Distortions a, a bunch. You know, there's Distortion Limited, and I worked for uh, Be Something Studios, which is now Zagoni Studios. I got one in there for them. You know, more recently uh, after there there be something, but to me that that's that's a, a huge deal, and I I just love masks. You know, uh, me and my buddy Josh Waslink, we started Nightmare Force Masks, which is sort of our our own little oh, really? you know, homage to yeah to eighties eighties masks. And uh, Josh is is he, it's his he's it's his brainchild and stuff. He he's the CEO. He runs the whole thing. He makes every single mask. He paints every mask that leaves there, sort of like like Jeff Death, Death Studio style, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, he's just building and building. We're we're eventually going to get to mass production and, and really you know start start jamming with that stuff. Oh, but, that's cool. Uh, I, I love masks. Like like you said, it, it is more sculptural. You get an expression in there. Yeah, you right. Freeze it in time, you know. And and trying to work in the movement and, and expression and stuff into something static like that is it, to me that that's so much more interesting and fun and, and, yeah. and freeing right yeah i think it's a sculptor like, especially you know oh yeah yeah i mean it's something beautiful about doing a great makeup right but right. you're you're early on in that process and it's so technical and everything has to make sense totally, yeah you know you you're making something with very specific parameters right. same thing with with an animatronic you know mask or something like that it has to do certain things it it, it has to get this range of of emotion you can't just throw it all in there even though right. we always try like every sculptor is like yeah. trying to put that <laughs> brow in you know but <laughs> it's like that's what i love about mass you know and again like i was saying before it's the entire process you know it's it's design it's sculpture mm-hmm. it's it's you know, mold making it's casting it's seaming it's hair work finishing paint you know everything like that and if 
you know, somebody like Jordu or, or Casey Love or something like that. They're doing it on, on a level that is so insane. It's, it is, it's screen ready, you know. All right. Um, yeah. Know, it's art. It really, monsters, it's art. You know, you know? it's like, I, oh, yeah. I love the idea of taking this lowbrow thing that people don't take seriously, like a, a Halloween mask and then like doing it so well that you can only regard it as like a fine art piece, you know, and it oh, really, it's really what it is. Um, but yeah, I love that. Yeah. I even, you know, doing pottery plaster molds. I mean, the process of oh, casting yeah. is fun when you, I, I enjoyed it cause we ran all Tony had that, Tony Gardner had that mask company that Lauren Githens and I started and ran for a few Ghost years. Factory, right? Ghost yeah, Factory. Yeah. And it was like, yeah. you know, making the one P, you know, casting a, a latex and polyfoam of the, the sculpture and then seaming it and then doing a production mold, a one piece plaster, uh, pottery plaster, and then pouring yeah. it so it gets the right skin. It's And the, it's just, I love it. I, I really enjoyed yeah. that. I was bummed that the whole thing got closed down but um i i thought that was yeah. so much fun just coming up with cool designs it's like i dig yeah. it and that's it that's it cool designs like yeah. it, just, it just it just has to be cool like there's no you know and that, right. that's what's awesome about it and like you said dwelling a mask and pulling that fresh latex and the smell of everything it's yeah. like there's nothing really like it i know it's I, so I cool I still need to master how I can get the latex to come through my paint job. Like I just want to leave that right, raw latex right. coming through yeah. because nothing looks like that. I know. But then I know. It yellows over time. I know. And I know. Get so fucked up and that's like, but there's nothing like that. I've tried a million different tricks, but I know. nothing works the same. You know? Yeah. It's like but that Ghost slight Factory, translucency. I mean, oh yeah. Ghost Factory. I mean, that, that, that stuff is amazing, man. That's why I, I did like five or six years ago, I did this art show at uh the lethal amounts gallery oh, yeah. in la yeah. and it was art of the halloween mask you know and i had you know collections of of old masks you know from the from the 60s and 70s alongside like brand new stuff and high-end stuff like jordu stuff and casey and like john fuller and like all the all these badasses and um i had some old school guys like like bob short involved and stuff like that, that you know doing new masks oh, and wow. stuff and um one big thing was i i wanted to have chet czar masks somewhere in there right <laughs> so i i asked everyone i'm like does anybody have any ghost factory i mean hemlock stitches you know what i mean those <laughs> yeah. those two masks the alone were giant like, masks. They were huge <laughs> they were oh, literally yeah. huge we like sculpt the first round of those were like too big but whatever yeah maybe i don't know if the, down. oh i don't know if those ones were there was like a certain phase that we didn't know what we were doing like that shotgun louis remember Lauren oh, did that yeah, shotgun, yeah, yeah. Louis. I think it was fucking like a Mardi Gras mask. It was so big. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Dude, we've, we've all done that. I mean, I still yeah. do that sometimes. Like, I'm like, it'll shrink. I can't. Right. I, I know. That's what we were and trying and like, to figure out. Yeah. That's so big. I actually did. I did a, a warmonger, like the, that demon, nightmare demon from, from American Werewolf with the helmet, the, the, the famous Rick Baker one, right? Yeah, Obviously. Yeah. Uh, it goes without saying, but I did it. And, I was all proud of it and shit, but I, I went real big because <laughs> it was going mass production with trick or treat studio. Right. So I knew like eventually it's going to get so, you know, molded down and, and shrunk down. And so it's so huge. I had it at monster Palooza and Rick comes by and I'm like, Holy shit, man. I'm like, Rick, Rick, what do you think? Cause Norman, you know, he's kind of fucked me up. I mean, Norman Cabrera <laughs> told me that it was awesome. So I thought I had, I had something I had, I had nailed it. You know what I mean? Cause Norman is the American werewolf right. guy. Right. But Rick walks by and he looks at it and he's just sort of like, "Yeah, it's too fucking big." And he like walked away. And I was like, "Oh shit!" Like you know, just, just uh, destroyed me. Yeah, I, I'm weird. like trying to explain, like, "No, no, wait, wait, it's mass production. That's why." Ah, oh, shit. You know, that was it. But oh man. But yeah, man, I I wanted I wanted a stitches or or hemlock or something just because I mean you're you're the epitome of mask gone fine art, right? Like. You started doing creature effects and mass. Now you are fine art. Like, you know, that's like, that's what you do and what you're known for now. So right. having one of your pieces there to me was like, see, just like Chet, Chet, he's like the whole spectrum there, you know, uh. but <laughs> there's a dude, there's this dude who will remain nameless for the podcast, but he kind of jerked me around for months and months saying that he had this whole collection of your stuff. And he would love to put it in the show. He had some Rick Baker pieces too that he said he had all his shit. And I'm like, cool, man. What's up? When can I get it? When can I get it? When can I get it? 
he seriously dragged me along like you know what with the carrot in front of me for months to the point where the show was about to happen and i'm like dude i don't think i'm getting these masks and he's like so you want these masks or what and i'm like what oh man how dare you <laughs> after all this fucking time i was like fuck you dude and it's like <laughs> i didn't want his masks you know what i mean at that point right the funny thing is though he put all those masks in the IMAX show a few months later. Oh, and I, man. Listened, I, I was like, son of a bitch, because those, they belonged in my art. Right. That's the whole thing. <laughs> that, was yeah, exactly. Art of the Halloween. Masks, better, you know better, I mean? better context to have them in, in, in an art, in yeah. an art show like that. Yeah. yeah and I the IMAX crowd, they don't care about yeah, right, Rick right. Baker half masks from 1974. Right. I mean, they don't, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i wish i i i wish i had kept kept all the i i know i have some like random stuff in my attic like foam filled but i don't think it's i don't remember it being anything good like it might have been there was that those ones where you where you look like the you put your it's like a head like a demon's eating you and it's got these hands and your your face oh, is yeah, there and yeah. it's like you're in the mouth and i think <laughs> i've got awesome. one of those up there or i have to i have to look it's probably all rotted by now but anyway so yeah yeah oh, that's yeah. awesome yeah, yeah love, it's love i didn't keep stuff. i didn't keep I, looking back i should have kept a bunch of dark man i had opportunities to keep so much cool stuff yeah. that i just didn't I, you know at the time i just kind of took it for granted you know what i mean oh yeah well, Tony still has them at, at the shop. I, I actually got to work oh, really? there last summer. Yeah, and and I go in there and I kind of felt like a dick. You know, like uh, Tom Flouts is like, hey, check it out. Like, this is the shop. And I'm all excited. And then I see the Dark Man mask in a case. And I was like, holy shit, the Dark Man <laughs> mask. And everyone's like, what? Like, of, of all the stuff that we've done, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm a mask nerd. Like, what do you want from me? You know? But yeah, those guys are so cool, man. Like, yeah. I actually I haven't gotten to meet Tony like, just because he wasn't around. He was right. on set or whatever when, when I went through there. And I only worked there that one time. But, you know, that, again, the blob era. I mean, uh, Ghost Factory stuff. I mean, that yeah. I wish I had a fucking time machine. You know what I mean? Like, that's. <laughs> it was fun. Insane. We had, we had, we definitely, definitely had a lot of fun uh, doing that stuff for sure. Uh, oh, definitely uh oh man i had a good point i was gonna ask you i was gonna ask you something one second uh it's gone you know the latex thing you might be able to do some yeah. kind of uv coating after yeah. you paint it so that it doesn't yellow i wonder if that would work or some kind of additive to the latex yeah that's definitely i, I gotta try that and i there's a couple out there uh i think Krylon makes makes a few but then the, the spray on it's like yeah. you know it, it can crack and stuff like that i need something kind of rubbery but yeah. there there is options one thing that that actually wayne anderson he came up with this kind of genius idea um well he's a badass himself wayne yeah I, yeah, know, yeah he's seriously. amazing so, dude he's he's amazing but he, he's always got these kind of cool little technical tricks he's like dude just go to fucking home depot bring some latex bring a mask and have them scan it and then so i have like a house paint like latex paint base paint oh, yeah. that's a latex color you know so i would just base the whole thing out in a latex color and that you know sort of cheats it yeah. well enough <laughs> but it's just not the same it doesn't I, have that translucent i remember seeing I, I remember yeah i remember seeing uh mark jerinko when i was working at rick's do something with latex i don't know he was like screwing around with rubber cement paint airbrushing it like spattering and stuff on latex on the raw latex i think it was just like yeah. some paint test and it looked really good like it almost looked like silicone oh, yeah. because of that that uh latex was was the base and like yeah, yeah. stuff kind of soaked in so i think there's there's a uh, although you know there the, the new thing though is like silicone masks where you can just totally you know oh yeah yeah it's just so and that's so complicated now though <laughs> Oh yeah, it's 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 too much. I can't do those kind of molds and and all yeah. that. All that measuring is too much for me. I just I just dwell it in you know, yeah. a nice thick tire tire mask, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I used I used to paint all my stuff with with that latex layer showing through and like do my teeth where they were just latex color with a slight like dust of white on there. Right. So they just kind of had this like tobacco stain like weird translucency like like teeth actually have. It was so cool. But then you see like somebody buys your mask. 
and they send you a picture like six years later yeah. and you're like, oh I, I love this thing and i'm like you still love that thing it looks like shit yeah, i'm like Jay. i gotta i gotta fix that thing i i'm so sorry and they're like what are you talking about like they don't even see yeah it. right but i'm like now obsessed yeah, with it, it so. changed it changed along they they were it was like they didn't notice it changing so they stayed in love yeah. with it as it went that's pretty cool actually it's kind of funny yeah it's like guacamole you leave it out and it turns brown all weird <laughs> after time that's basically <laughs> so fucked up so okay we're getting near the I, i'm keeping you longer than than uh i said i would but uh do you do, what oh, give i can do this all night <laughs> i know it's, it's pretty fun i have to admit talking talking about the old days and and effects and stuff um you know so what's the state of the industry now i have been out of it for so long and i honestly i kind of was like i was at you know of the era when jurassic park came around and digital came around and i was thinking oh it's over and and it didn't go away which was super cool like it it's been there's been like a resurgence over the last few years and it's gotten you know you got people like guillermo who's doing uh guillermo del toro doing you know, pushing for practical effects and a lot of directors are starting to do that and so i'm i'm actually really happy that to see that it's still super active and it's not going anywhere um oh, so, yeah. i mean how is it how is it compared to when you started like what are the what's it like now yeah i mean what, what's crazy is you know jurassic park there was that moment where everyone like froze and they were like oh <laughs> shit, what's down, gonna man. happen you know, and then there were the people that said this isn't going to last, and there were people that said no, there'll always be a place. Right. And then we, I came in like way after that, and it's funny as I'm coming in, people are saying this is a dying industry. What right. are you doing? Right. Why are you right. coming here? And I'm like, look, I don't. Even if I have to be here for the death rattle, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> I mean, this, I don't have any other options. You right, know? right. Like, I, you know, I have no skills whatsoever. <laughs> you know, so I. uh I've seen it kind of fluctuate. Like every time there's a writer strike, it's like, it's all over. And then it comes back and, you know, COVID was a thing where it was like, Oh shit, how are we going to bounce back? But then after COVID it's like, everyone just wanted content. So it was just like people right. were jamming, everyone was working yeah. and genre stuff is always like a sure thing, right? You right. do a horror movie, you do a, a, a comic book movie or something like that. You're always going to have an audience there. It's built in. So unfortunately, what I see is that there has to be Guillermo people that are so obsessed with it that they're they're insisting that it's mm -hmm. there. I, I think that that's good that, that those people are yeah. there. And I think there will be more of that. And I hope there is more of that. But a lot of times, too, a lot of it has become like specialty costumes, which is still amazing. And it's an amazing art form, but it's just a little different than like the fun monster stuff, right. and the animatronics and the, the puppets that I love. So it's like a lot of times we're doing lighting you know, reference and we're doing things that have right. to be wheeled around on set so that your actor has an eye line and you might build the shit out of it, but it's all going to get covered up with CG right. anyway. And that I don't necessarily think that like, I don't, I don't have a problem with CG. I just think it needs to work in congruence better. For sure. And you have to have somebody like Yermo, somebody that's leading the charge that goes, no, we need to do it this way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm insisting yeah. and I have the clout to, to throw my weight around you know what i mean and i think more people are doing that you have the whole independent market where people are coming up saying no i want to be yeah, yeah. old school shit like yeah. that's why I, I got into this so we'll always have a place and and uh, I, so the state of the industry is good right now everyone seems to be working you know there's always something to do but i i think that the art form still needs to be celebrated by when you go to the theater, you see that finished product up there in all its right. glory. And, you know, and, and that that's really the point, right? That's what it should be. Mm -hmm. It's not about streaming. It's not about, you know, cleaning everything up with CG. It's, you know, it's about going to the theater and looking up there and actually seeing the puppet that you built. You know right. I mean? Yeah. I think that, I think that young, there's, there's a lot of, I, I, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the the industry can or the effects industry specifically can really it's like Guillermo is sort of the savior for makeup effects he's got he's an oscar dude now he's got oh, like yeah. what does he have two oscars now or one i don't know how many i think two yeah yeah i think he's got two oscars and it's like he's the guy he's the monster guy he's he's one of us that made it in the, in as a director you know oh, yeah. he had an effect shop 
he's into it. So he's kind of like, you know, one of the big reasons I think it's stuck around and he's inspiring. You know, there's, there's these younger directors. I worked uh, on this independent movie called bliss doing like a painting for the movie. And um, the director, Joe Vegas, he's, he's like practical, practical effects guy. He's like all about old school. He shot that movie bliss on 16 millimeter film that's awesome yeah even though you can kind of fake it he didn't want to he like totally did it all 16 millimeter um and he's all about practical effects and i know like everything he does has practical effects in it and it's like and it, and he's kind of like the ne- the new generation of you know oh, yeah. independent horror directors so i think there's i think it's it's good it's a good sign um oh yeah i liked bliss a lot actually and i i I have a hard time with a lot of new horror. I'm like, yeah, like yeah. But I, I thought it was great, you know, and, I, yeah. and that's <laughs> refreshing, you know, like yeah. that guy's stuff is great. You know, you got Steve Kostansky is doing awesome stuff. He was one of the Astron six guys from, from Canada. You yeah, know, he that. did the, the void and, and. Oh um, yeah. That's a, that was, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Psycho Goreman was his new one was more, more like a trauma style, like superhero toxic Avengers. Oh, yeah, I haven't mean? seen it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty fun, but even guys like like Robert Egger, he's the guy that did The Witch, you know, and just oh, right, more, yeah, more yeah. recently, mm-hmm. yeah, Northman. I mean, that dude, he he's his pedigree. He's like a super art, you know, auteur style yeah, director, yeah, yeah, you know. And now he's getting bigger and bigger. Like I think this Northman movie is probably his most commercially successful so far. So it's like those guys, oh, right. you know, they yeah. they believe in that stuff as well. Yeah, so there yeah. is a whole new generation, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it, that's that's pretty huge. So I think there'll always be a, a, a you know a place for it. But I'm like, I want to go back to the cellar dweller days. Like that's like <laughs> that's my shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> dude, I love. I'll that. never forget, man. One of the first, the I got a funny cellar dweller story. My first like shop job, I think, was on, was on that. I was green as hell. I was like just out of high school, and John Criswell had me make. A, a mold of cellar dweller's hand and i made it too thin and i pried it open and it broke in half <laughs> and he got so pissed at me he was so mad at me i felt like shit oh my god and it was like you know we repaired it it was and it was like mmi you can get away with that stuff it doesn't matter it's getting covered with oh, hair yeah. Everything looks like crap anyway. I mean, Beekler was awesome. Beekler was super cool, a, a great dude. That's the one thing about Mitch. It's like he'd always talk shit about the MMI stuff he did at, at Beekler's, but he never, you know, talked. He always talked fondly of John. Like he always said John gave him like a his start. He got him his first car. He was really like a generous guy in that way. But um, yeah, they sent me to oh, Italy man. to work on those movies. That's it's, huge, man pulse pounders cellar dweller and it was like they sent me over for cellar dweller i'd never even been in a plane before like to another state (laughs) and i went to italy and uh yeah cellar dweller and then uh, then that pulse pounders movie and then this really terrible thing called transformations really bad piece of shit i've seen it oh really (laughs) you've seen that (laughs) Oh, dude, yeah. I, 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 I think I have it on VHS. Somewhere. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but there's these like bubbly pus sacks that people developed on their skin. And that yeah, was yeah. that was my innovation for that movie where I, it was like so funny. It was I would stip a latex on and I would do the whole thing where you pull a little bubble out and then I would inject it with pus or whatever. And that was like. <laughs> <laughs> me me innovating on this oh, i was so low budget it was like nobody cared about the movie at all it was like oh that's this i could go into it there's like so many so many crazy stories but okay okay let's let's wrap things i love up. it though I, <laughs> I just 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 to finish beekler i mean like like i i love that era right yeah, yeah i mean yeah. so so Dollar was huge and think about the guys that came through beekler shop you know think about Chris know. Will, yourself mitch devane jeff dave, kenamore dave I mean, kinlan like Dave Killen, I mean, these guys are like, you guys became legendary and the top of the class. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's amazing. Yeah, from Beekler and Savini has those guys too, right, like, yeah, like the Mike totally. Tursigs and stuff like that. Yep. You know, and, and the John Volches, and it's like, you know that that is part of it, right? Yeah, it's an yeah. important part. 
Yeah. And that's why I like the, the schlocky, you know, yeah. boogie stuff <laughs> so much, you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I do too. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it just it's like it's funny because i'm you know probably 15 years older than you so it's like my fondest memories were the 70s super shitty stuff in the 70s yeah, yeah. you know when i was a kid uh like like uh octoman i saw i remember seeing octoman oh, yeah. on tv as a little kid and being like whoa totally freaking me out you know and thinking it was like the most amazing thing <laughs> but i still oh, love definitely. it you know i still i i just you know i think when you see stuff at a certain age it just sticks with you and you just love you oh, love it course. no matter what you know you don't the flaws are part of what you love about it because it's just it's oh, its yeah. own thing you're not judging it against reality you're just a a kid who's having this amazing experience with something that's freaking him out you know what i mean exactly and there's beauty to it there's something yeah, there i know right even though it, it's cornflakes and shit like all, all the all the you know <laughs> totally. the, the, the 70s italian shit like all, all yep. that i love all that stuff yeah. you know and, and i mean like burial ground like I, i'm like obsessed with that shit you know right. it's like but yeah yeah, but yeah it's awesome so okay well to wrap it up what what are i mean what's what's in your future i also want to ask you what are like some of the notable what are you proud of having worked on what are your favorite projects that you've worked on that you think you've done your best work with oh man that's that's kind of a rough one i i mean um i'm pretty excited about some of the stuff we've been doing at KB lately uh mm. greg nicotero has the new creep show series uh, oh you were which is oh, that's right I, i'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you but that you worked on something i did for that that last Subaraya or whatever the oh yeah you're yeah. credited on it because I the, I did the painting for that the painting that's right yeah that's <laughs> right yeah yeah, yeah Dave, Dave Grasso did did that character that that awesome monster oh, okay the cool side. cool yeah yeah which which is dude Dave is a badass man he's like yeah. you know one of the top dudes you know, yeah he's as awesome. well yeah he's a good guy and I, I gotta learned get him a on too. shitload from him oh yeah. dude yeah he's he's amazing he's another one of those guys that can do everything you know? right yeah his, yeah and his he's... digital stuff is out of this world yeah so, yeah you know so but, so, um, so you're doing creep show you're you're doing some really cool stuff for that yeah i'm, I'm just having a blast with it because it's very fun just 80s style monster stuff oh yeah and because, would, because greg is in charge oh yeah and, and greg, it's greg's show so right he, what, what he says goes so it's like we don't really have a lot of production breathing down our neck and we get to just do fun stuff and it's big and there's puppets and it's crazy. And, I, yeah. and we've been doing even miniature puppets and stuff like really trying to do, you know, what, what we always wanted to do with this type of stuff. So I'm lucky to be a part of that. You know, we get to do a, a 12 foot werewolf, like marionette style puppet that had a head that was sort of like a throwback to fluffy from the original creep show. Mm -hmm. So oh, cool. For, for me, that was a huge deal. I was like the coolest thing ever just as a, as a nerd and, and as, as a sculptor, just being able to, to jump on that. And it was, the head was massive. It, it was just so cool. <laughs> so, you know, stuff like that, that, that's my favorite stuff to do. You know, I've, yeah. I've, I just creature suits, you know, big animatronic stuff. I want to do the bigger, the monster, the better, you know, for me. And that, that's been really exciting to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, those are those, you know, those are the things, you know, stuff like The Walking Dead, which I think you worked, you've worked on The Walking Dead. Yeah, I got it's, to work on the, the last two seasons. So okay, yeah, cool. like Walking Dead and Creep Show. I still, to me, those are like, those are the ones that I see and I'm like, damn, I wish I was still, <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah. you know, that's when I start, kind of miss it is, is those kind of projects. It's like, damn, oh, well, you know, you, you, you can't have everything. But so I, I, so I'm definitely envious of some of the stuff you get to work on now uh you know yeah it's been it's been fun man and zombies i could do zombies all day me so too I'm, man i'm excited about that so that's what my next show is going to be all these zombie death bots oh, i call nice. them they're all the zombie robot combinations like you Dude, if, i love that if you made a zombie if you made a robot out of cadavers is the concept oh, or or if you made a ro if or you made robots out of humans and the bodies started dying, but the mechanics kept working and they're really old and rusty. So that's gonna be okay. the show I got out to. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, I wanted to say that actually about about dystopia. Like the, oh, yeah. the concept behind everything 
is so insane. Like, I mean, the artwork is so awesome already, but taking it to that level, when I, when I was going through, talk about D and D, right? I got yeah, this vibe totally. of like, this is, this is totally a role-playing game in the yeah. making. Yeah, like yeah. the whole thing, the worlds you're creating, the different classes and stuff. And like, yeah. it's like one of those monster Bible encyclopedias of like just the monster manual style. That was, that was the like idea. You know? Yeah. I love that. So I'm I love hope, that. I that's mean, what... Have you thought about going that far? Oh like, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah for sure. That's, that's yeah. There's so like anything you could think of. I'm thinking about that. <laughs> TV yeah. show, movie, role-playing game, oh, yeah. Magic the Gathering kind of card game, vid- VR world. You know, it's like I, I'm whatever comic book, and you know, that's it's like that's next year. I'm going to start thinking about that because I still have to get like so much, so much. Uh, I'm still delivering on that Kickstarter, that five year old Kickstarter. So, oh, yeah. So it's like I have yeah. to get that out of the way and some commissions and stuff. But yeah, I'm glad you like it. Dude, it was um, worth it, man. It was worth the wait. Uh, that I book appreciate is it. It's, it's <laughs> beautiful. So and it's awesome. all, and, and it's, dude, when you do when you do the movie, hit oh me yeah, up, man. Oh, I absolutely. Wanna, I wanna the <laughs> that would be the, the the dream is to have that turn into a movie and have a bunch of my friends working on it. That would be the best, and, and get to get to work on that stuff again. That would be super cool. So it's possible. You circle, never know. Man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you never man. know. You never know. Uh, well, cool, man. Let, I, I'm going to let you go because I've kept you way, way too long. But, man, that was super, super fun catching up and uh, hearing your story. Oh, dude, I really blast. enjoyed it. Really enjoyed um, talking with you about this stuff. It's cool. Made, made me. Made I enjoy me... talking to you, man. Like I said, you're you're a hero, man. Seriously. Uh, and before, <laughs> before, before we go, I just got to mention one thing, right? The troll that you did for Hansel and Gretel right oh thanks <laughs> yeah just, just so just so you know that's like a benchmark i i mean i'm that movie was awful i i, I you know that right yeah i haven't but, seen it <laughs> i knew it was i heard yeah it was bad, exactly <laughs> that character e- even just the behind the scenes like you know movement test that that spectral put on youtube yeah dude that that is next level you mark Tracking, everyone involved it's a perfect creature effect right it's a perfect creature head suit animatronic it does everything i mean from that tongue the way the tongue moves yeah i mean he did the way that sculpture crinkles and wrinkles all in the right places i i aspire everything i work on i want to push to that level like seriously that that. (laughs) hellboy 2 that that whole era of spectral i i wish the entire industry was just like ramping it up to 11 the way you guys did on, on that project. So I'm just, just throwing that out. there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I, that was one that I kind of went to go work just for a couple of weeks, you know, just as a little short gig after I was out. So it's like, yeah. you know, I'll, I like to be able to do that from time to time, you know, work on, do a mask or a sculpture, but Mitch did the maquette. I was sculpting oh, off wow. of Mitch's maquette for that creature. That's yeah. Awesome. So I was like, I didn't even know that. Yeah. So that was kind of a cool thing. He couldn't do it. So they hired me to do it. That's and awesome. I just, yeah. Yeah. So, well, thanks. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. It was nice. Love it, man. Love it. Uh, so uh, how can people find your work if they want to see it? I'll uh, put it well, in the description my... also, but what's your website cool, and all that? Cool. I appreciate that. My, my Instagram page is probably the best. It's, it's at Mikey Rots, M I K E Y R O T S. And uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find my website is Mikey Rots as well, MikeyRots.com. So um, check out NightmareForce.com if you get a chance to see those masks. And uh, yeah, I mean, hit me up. I'm down to bullshit about monsters any day. All right, cool. Well, thanks for, yeah, that Mikey Rots is like the greatest name too. I, that's one thing. That's part of the reason uh, that you, 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 you've always stuck in my head is like Mikey Rots. That's such a great name. <laughs> Every time I see Mikey Rots, I'm like, good name. Good name. Um, oh, that's, that's cool. yeah. So, okay. Well don't hang up yet, but we'll stop the recording, but, um, yeah, thanks again. Totally had a great time. Super fun talking to you and, uh, say, Definitely, say, say goodbye to the audience. Say goodbye audience. Goodbye everybody. Thank you for, you know, dealing with me for this long, but you know, Chet, you're the man, seriously. Oh, you're the man. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Thanks.